This year, move the dirt and make an impact by signing up for Power Athlete Program to crush your goals. Join our tens of thousands of athletes around the globe already empowering their performance as power athletes. For less than a dollar a day, get our world-class coaching delivered straight to the palm of your hand. Our programming is performance-driven and goal-oriented. Finally tuned through my first-hand experience playing the NFL and subsequent decade-long coaching and collaborating with some of the baddest motherfuckers on the planet. As a special time offer for the month of January, pay up front for a full year of training will give you a free 15-minute consult with myself or one of the crew, plus your choice of nutrition protocol, putting you on the best path for success. Visit powerathlete.com forward slash training and start today. Those who start tomorrow never get shit done. Start fucking today. I mean, really, we're talking about people who are afraid of the air. That's that's how far gone they are. Yeah. I mean, you, you see you see pictures or sometimes video clips of people hiking, for example, just by themselves, hiking in the woods uh, with a mask or, or even with some other sillier contraption. I've seen like, a, um, I don't even know what you call these things. Uh, it, it's an entire enclosure. Like a space, like, like a space suit? Kind like of, but, but it was like a box, like with, of, of, you know, clear see-through plastic that zips up and hmm. just walking around in their little, in their little box in the woods. Mobile safe space. Uh, don't you really think that this is just like an evolutionary experience for them? Like they don't really want to breathe the air of other people and they're just using this as an excuse. Like, uh, you know, um, Charles who's, uh, does our video and, um, kind of edits the podcast. <laughs> We've been like deep diving. At least I've been forcing him to deep dive, uh, into this metaverse thing. Cause it fucking scares the shit out of me that people are willing to like put on their IR goggles and like buy real estate and like NFTs and like live in this alternate reality that they could just make their present reality better. That they feel that like they have to go somewhere virtual to start. Like it, it fucking blows my mind. Like I just read uh, uh, Snoop owns some real estate or some like music real estate in the metaverse, which I don't even know what metaverse it is because like Microsoft has a, ver has a metaverse, Facebook, there's all these different metaverses that are independent of each other. And somebody's bought like the land next to it for like 1.5 million or 1.3 million. And I was like trying to look at it and I'm like, what the fuck? And all I could think of is like, so are, is this going to be like the Sims or are they going to be like a uh, player one or that awful Bruce Willis movie where he's surrogates, like, surrogates, which was a fucking weird movie. Like, is that where we're headed? And then on top of it, people that don't want to go there, just go to your house and beat your ass while you're asleep, but while you're laying in your alternate reality, I'm like, it's fucking weird. I just think these are all steps. Like we're all just moving down a interesting escalator of life. Not all of us. No, I mean, look not at, all. Look yeah. at, not us. Look at look at how many people though are are willing to essentially live in uh, massively multiplayer online games. Is, is that really all that different? You're just you're just taking that to a more immersive level, really, right? I mean, I, I had a friend when I was younger um, when when World of Warcraft first came out. And I, I played it for a couple of months and I got my friend to do it. And I was like, yeah, this is fun. We should do this together. And I lost interest after a couple of months. And that was the end of it. He did not lose interest after a couple of months. He disappeared for five years. And that is all he did for five years. And did he become like a 99th level wizard? Uh, ironically, I guess he got really, he did get really good at the game and he, and he got, I guess, kind of famous in the game. I, I, I talked to him about it years and years later when he had, had, uh, stopped playing, doing nothing but playing World of Warcraft. And I so guess he met a girl and had sex and then he basically forgot about World of Warcraft. <laughs> uh, you know, actually, um, that, that is almost what happened. Yeah. 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 He, he, He's he, like, uh, He's like, he met a girl at sex and then he's like, what is this World of Warcraft thing? I, I, uh, girls are way better than World of Warcraft. That, that is, that is, that did have to do with why he stopped playing. Uh, he did go back to it though, eventually, but, but I guess he got famous in the game because of all the things and all like the little trinkets he acquired and stuff. And he was like in one of the best groups, uh, I, top 10 of all of them or something. So we played video games when I was growing up, like my Tyson's punch out and Mario bros. And then, uh, I remember when I was early in the, uh, in the NFL, uh, when I was in Philly, uh, Sega came in and gave us all, um, like Sega units, Xboxes with uh, halo. Hmm. So we were like, you know, sort of playing halo. Cause, uh, I didn't have it at the time. I didn't have a TV 
or really anything in my house. I was still on this idea that I was a monk and I wasn't going to subscribe to television. And then uh, not only did they give us Xboxes, but they gave us TVs. So I had a TV in my house hooked up to an so Xbox. So they got you. Oh uh, yeah, I used to like you know on Friday night like drink beers and and fucking play Halo and it was fun. Yeah, but then we'd go. Yeah, out. that was that was about the extent of video games for me. So yeah, I did here and there with some friends. I guess it's fun. I don't really care. Yeah, and then at the end of the day, I you know it's it's like it doesn't feel like uh, I want to submerge my entire existence into this and live into this video game. And then I think like, how are they going to eat? Do they have to stop to use the restroom? Like, uh, like what are all the practical things on this? Bags. Yeah, just colonics bags, fucking catheter, and you just, oh. Uh, this, I guess, is an unsolicited plug. I have a buddy that jumped into a business. It's nerdfitness.com. Mm -hmm. Essentially, like, finding ways to what? get people that like are. Steve, Steve something, right? I, I don't well, know. Well, my, my buddy's Jim, so he, he okay. does so wait a minute. Can we virtual just, training. Can we just do, can we just make them jacked in the metaverse? Could we sell NFTs of well, muscles? I mean, their whole website is before and after pictures, but. Yeah, essentially getting well. It'll be one of those microtransaction and, things, right? Where you yeah. can you can you can lift weights in the metaverse. And it's going to take time to get jacked, or you just pay. Uh, you well, mean Grand the Theft Auto, give, San give, Andreas? Yeah, yeah we're give, just going to give design. Zuckerberg a thousand bucks, and uh, there you go. Well, that's what's wild, and this is uh, the biggest issue I have with this. Is we've already seen uh, the draconian approach of Facebook and social media. Where uh, you know Zuckerberg just announced on, uh, or you know he's in you know some form of government hearing. I saw a clip of where they were talking about fact, che fact checkers, and he yep. really that uh, revealed mm -hmm. that it's opinion that the people they get. Of course, paid. we all knew that. Well, of course they did. But <laughs> like, like um, all, all it is is some uh, paid fact checker. Something comes through. They Google it, or maybe they don't. Y yes, and then correct. they make a decision. So they they're supposed to they do have a they, I'm sure they have a short list of approved sources yeah. and they just search through those and whatever yeah you know, true false or true, false, they just go ah uh, fuck it this like is what that. I like yeah yep. and so like the their idea of fact checking is completely arbitrary and it's opinion and yet they're booting people shutting people down canceling businesses in this because it's fucking effectively it's their playground they can play and they can do whatever the fuck they want well and if you like, don't like it just make your own Facebook man yeah. And that, you know what? The that, that's what the the idiot libertarian would say. Yeah. And uh, but at the end of the day, like they control it. I mean, they're the gatekeepers. So now all of a sudden now people are like willing to invest in their metaverse. What happens when you get in the metaverse? You got all these bitching NFTs. You're fucking rolling and flossing in your metaverse, chilling in your you know metaverse house. And then Mark Zuckerberg goes, yeah, no, I don't like your politics or more importantly, you owe me money. We're booting you out of my metaverse, and now you're yeah, shit's or, useless. Yeah, or or um, excuse me, you have not gotten your hundred and fifty seventh booster for COVID seventy nine. You are uh, you are barred from from your cool stuff until you get it. Yeah, which and, is and, weird. And don't think that can't, can't happen. COVID. Look at what's happening right now. Come on. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, but then what's wild is now they have like, uh, like it, 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 dude. It's just as I got deeper into this thing, I'm like. And people are so excited about it. I'm like, why are you giving these fucking people that have already proven to be uh, maniacal, tyrannical, and like fucking draconian and, and to the biggest degree in their idea of like somehow you know pushing humanity forward? And now you're going to give them more power by by basically living your life within the confines of what they've created. Like that fucking blows my mind. Some people, I, I guess you could say that the the prospect of a life in the metaverse and what that could be, it, it might be more appealing than the prospect of reality. And I mean, look at, again, look at video games, right? Why, why are, are some of these video games so appealing? Uh, there are different factors, but one of them has to be, of course, related to effort. It takes very little effort to, to quote unquote, accomplish things. If we're talking about like expending calories effort work takes very little you can just sit there you're just moving your hands and you get that feeling of accomplishment also of course the games are very structured and uh, they are set up in a way that is rewarding and allows everybody to 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 progress and life is is very unstructured and chaotic and so some people I'm sure many people would willing again, they are willingly choosing to do that right now with World of Warcraft and whatever other MMOs are, are big these days. So 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, the only way the only way the metaverse is is not even more appealing to a lot of those people would be if they personally changed, right? If if they were in a better state, uh, maybe you could even say spiritually, maybe they would get off the video games and try to do something else. But that's that doesn't seem to be the trend. It doesn't seem to be the trajectory for for a lot of people and for our culture in general, right? It seems to be downward, unfortunately. Well, the uh, I started watching a bunch of clips of these people that are you know considered early adopters, and you know now everybody's an expert and has some TikTok page that's effectively giving advice. And unfortunately, I logged on and uh, was like going through a lot of it. And this guy made an interesting point where he's like, "I would rather be poor and have nothing in the real world and be rich and like you know fucking rolling in the metaverse." And uh, the guy like asked him, they were like, well, you know, if you could effectively just like pod your body into, you know, cryostasis kind of and just live your entire existence in the metaverse, would you? He's like 100 percent. I could be who I wanted to be. And the thing I find is like, no, you can be whoever you want to be in the real world. What you're moving towards is like hard, though. Well, it is hard and there's failure and this and there's, you know, fucking pitfalls and people and this. I mean, it's a really a real life. Choose your own fucking adventure. And what blows my mind is uh, the Matrix is starting to look a lot like a documentary. Because, yeah. I mean, that's effectively what Maybe happened, right? Maybe it is, John. Uh, dude, Keanu, fucking ahead of the curve. But, I mean, you know, like the analogy just reminded me as soon as he said it was like them in the pods living the, their whole life yeah. and then getting pulled out and red-pilled. What, like, what value, though, do, do people like even represent if they just live in a pod? I mean, that was one of the ironic I guess you could say plot holes in the matrix was um, why didn't these machines just, just make some nuclear power reactors? Like there are much easier ways to just get energy. You don't need to set up this whole thing and, and harvest people as batteries, just uh, uh, nuclear power guys like that, that works a lot yeah. better. So, Oh yeah. Uh, and, and whenever they talk about like power and coal and all this, I'm like nuclear power, it's fucking been by far the best one we've had. Now we're shutting that shit down. Uh, well, that you're talking about the science of nuclear power, but have you considered the politics of nuclear power? Uh, yeah, it's a big problem. But yeah, no, I, I dude, I with I'm with you, dude. It just it uh, it feels and like this is something I constantly worry about. Like uh, I think it was Tex was telling me, um, what is it? Music and your haircut crystallize after the age of about 25, 26. and then you can kind of like look at men over the course of time, and they have the exact same haircut going. Uh, going forward and then like same with music so I always worry about haircuts and also music like not being uh, I guess dynamic or you know palatable enough to like learn you know maybe get a new haircut learn some new music but also look at this stuff and I think I'm like this looks like shit this sucks what are what are what are the 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 popular haircuts we, I know the popular music and I hate it what are the popular haircuts well is like it, I is, think is the man like, bun thing still popular or is it the I, I don't know turn around let's see it <laughs> it's just, no but it's it's uh like you know I'm what not happens. sure I have a popular haircut at like my no, my hair well, strategy yours... is I just let my hair grow until it annoys me enough to make me want to get a haircut and then I just make it shorter that's those are my instructions I don't know just make it shorter and not look bad and then I just rinse and repeat Dude, but, I'm the same way, but instructor to cut a mullet. That's about it. Two well, hair, yeah, haircuts a year. Uh, uh, well, we go to the same chick that cuts hair, and she's like, Chris's mullet looks fucking awful. And I'm like, uh, No, she didn't. Yeah, Nicolette tells me how bad it looks like dog shit. Well, she's the one cutting it. I know. And she said, That's what you demand. And I was like, You know what? So you wait, you're purposely. Well, do a better job. You're, pers- <laughs> you're purposely <laughs> giving people bad haircuts. She's, she's like, reading between the lines. Yeah, when she you knows say give you me want. a mullet, she's like, oh, this guy wants to look like shit. I'm going to fuck no, shit up. I'm challenging myself <laughs> to own this. This is a character challenge and development first, where I don't give. First a of damn. all, the fucking 70s and 80s called, they want their mullet back. Well, my truck matches my haircut. Ah, dude, you're not living in Roadhouse. You're not Swayze. I, I, I know. I, I know it's hard for you. Wait, to I, fucking... the, the, the bigger challenge might be to get a haircut that draws no attention. Because in my experience, people who get weird, offbeat haircuts are, are actually just trying to look cool or get attention. Well, I'm I'm creating my avatar, but it's me. Well, truck it, isn't that haircut. Real, well, I mean, isn't that what you do in life? You create the life that you want. Yeah, I I started this whole metaverse change, but it's in real life. I like it just it, it it was weird hearing the guy talk about like who he thought he could be in the metaverse. And I was like, 
you know, you can do all that yourself. Like you can make a change. You can be the like the person. Yeah, but then you're- again, you, it's hard, man. You have to get up and you have to drag your draggy limbs around and you gotta work like, out. Think about things and come up with good ideas and yeah. That, that, that's I think that's primarily the answer is why yeah so, but, all that sounds too hard. So let's I, I like try to the do idea it. of sitting in my gamer chair with my gamer paraphernalia and just moving my fingers and achieving uh, honor and recognition that way. Yeah, it, it uh man I like the it's uh I've challenged Charles to do a deep dive into this just so that I have somebody as like a counterpoint because I think this shit's ridiculous. And as I look at it, I'm like, people are losing their minds on this. It's all speculation. And I think it's just fascinating that people are, are they sprinting to it? I could, I could it see the NFTs and stuff here for the long haul though, especially yeah. among younger people. I could see minimally it becoming something like maybe something akin to, I don't know, like card collecting uh, now, which yeah. is, or, or other memorabilia. Or like yeah. shoes, like uh, people yeah. collect shoes. Like that's yeah. a, that's another one that tripped me out. I watched a Vice about uh, sneaker heads and you know how these guys. Where they don't even collect. wear them, right? They don't even open them. It's just to have. Yeah, them. they're just in box and they use them as some form of trading currency and they display yeah. them. And there's a guy that has like all of his displayed and people pay to come view his shoes. Yeah, and uh, he has like a waiting list. And these people are like, "Oh my god, those are Jordan retro ones. Uh, they haven't yellowed." Uh. And I'm like, "Holy shit, dude." Like you don't wear these shoes and it just, it was amazing. And then he has like a, uh, they have like online, um, auctions for them. And like, it just, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Like how, like how far that's gone. Like maybe it's like the NFTs and like, what's fascinating. Cause I was always like, well, what is this digital art? Like, why are people creating these? It's actually how they're populating the metaverse. So you effectively buy right, the NFT, stick it you, in your, yeah. that becomes your avatar. I saw your, someone in some uh, I guess you'd call it metaverse. Did you see this? They bought a yacht for yeah, like three hundred thousand. Yeah, it was. Three, I thought it was yeah, more three, than that. The one that I saw was three hundred grand. Okay, that the guy bought a yacht in the metaverse. The only problem is, like, do you own that in all metaverses, or is it only in one metaverse? And more importantly, who sold it to you, and how do they have the ability to create yachts in that metaverse unless they own the real like? Like, there's a whole lot of questions I have. I'm like, did he just buy a yacht of an NFT? If that's the case, then you can port it over anything. But the way they related it, and we jumped on a, um, a site that is a wholesale site for land that's uh, selling uh, land in the meta, different metaverses. So we were going through it, and I'm like, like, who are you paying this to? Who owns this? Like, who created it? Who's your landlord? You know, and like, who's in control of this? And they're like, no, no, it, it, it's don't um, worry about it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's unregulated. I'm like, uh, regulated is it's, not necessarily de- a bad it's thing. It's decentralized, yeah. man. How could it go wrong? <laughs> yeah. There was one dude uh, was selling a three hundred thousand dollar NFT and he fucked up and and uh, entered it for three thousand dollars and it sold and the guy was upset but it's decentralized so there's nobody to gripe to there's no eBay to appeal to so uh, I've been I, I sunk about ninety minutes this morning I've been doing um, uh, hyperbaric treatments so we had uh, uh, Dr. Joe Derudi who's uh, you know like one of the foremost experts on hyperbarics on the podcast and he put together this protocol and they've been testing it. And then after we had it on, it sounded so good. And also people started hitting me up and being like, oh, you know, do you believe in the hyperbarics? Do you think it works? And I'm like, 100%. And they're like, well, have you done it? And I'm like, no. So I've been going through the treatments to try to actually create some credibility. And so I get about 90 minutes. What have minutes you noticed um, so far, if anything? I really haven't noticed anything, but I, I did not feel cognitively off. So uh, that's a big one. People see, you know, feel more lucid. Um, you know, better memory. I mean, there's a whole bunch of interesting pieces for it. I mean, it's legitimate life extension. I mean, they've been able to prove it, you know, increases telomere length by a third. And so there's some really interesting stuff in life extension. Um, the one that I really noticed is uh, my eyesight. So the eyeball gets saturated with oxygen and it changes the shape of your eye. Uh, like I feel like, especially at night when we were driving in the car, like my vision um, to like see far, it's like fucking laser beams. Like I, I was like asking my wife, I'm like, can you read that? She's like, I don't even see what you're looking at. I'm like, that sign up there, it says this. And she's like, no, I don't even know what that is. So like probably like 2010 eyesight. So wow. whereas uh, my other buddy who did it, his eyesight got worse because his eyes round and it said it, or he had a stigma, you know, something happened yeah. with it. But um, so that's what I've noticed. Uh, what else? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I really haven't noticed, but I did some before and after neurological testing. 
Mm-hmm. So I'm interested to see like kind of what the before and after kind of playing paints and, and, uh, you know, have some interesting ops, uh, like options for people that are going through some neurological issues. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Something so, I haven't looked into, but it's, it's been on a list of, it's but, just not easily accessible. So well, yeah, yeah, Dr. Joe's in Tampa. So I'm not sure how oh, far that is from uh, you. Uh, okay, it's only an hour. No, 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 no. It's only an hour and 15, maybe. Oh, north. Oh, I, I was thinking you said Pensacola. Yeah, no, I'm right in the middle of the state. So I'm like yeah. Yeah, an hour 15 or so from Tampa. Yeah, that's where um, um, I'll make a note. Ken Ford has the Institute of Human and Machine Cognition there. But yeah, if you want me to introduce you to Dr. Joe down in Tampa, uh, the only the, the protocol, though, is uh, five dives a week. So you go five days a week for eight weeks wow. and it's about 60, 60 minutes under 15 minutes to go up and down. So it's roughly like 90 minutes a day, five days a week for eight weeks for 40 wow. dives. Yeah, it's a commitment. So it ends, ends up being like 60 hours that you're stuck in this tube over the course of two months. And so it's pretty solid investment of time just to carve three hours out of your day. So for me, I got to drive roughly 30, 35 minutes each way. And then yeah. once I get there, 90 minutes and get it's roughly about three hours out of the day. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I felt in that, uh, anytime soon but i well I, I just felt disingenuous like uh you know we have the guy on the podcast i do all this research on it it looks fucking amazing and then people are hitting me up and they're like well have you done it i'm like fuck yeah no I yeah i mean you it. still can say hey I'm, I'm 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 talking about uh what is what has been shown in the literature and here i'm parroting some things that experts have said but yeah there's a difference like uh, i in virginia i had a, an infrared sauna and so I had written about and spoken about some of the some of the benefits in the literature and then got one. And then so it, it is helpful to say, hey, uh, here's what the science says. And then here I've used it a lot myself. Here's what I've noticed. Um, and in the case of an infrared sauna, it was obviously the effects are mild, but that that, that would be in line with the research, too. Um, but I did notice a couple of benefits uh, related to blood flow, possibly a little bit better recovery. But that's what you'd expect. Maybe uh, also a little bit lower levels of inflammation um, in my joints. So not that I tend to have joint issues, but a little bit less crepitus in my knees, for example. I did notice that. So, yeah. Well, they. Um, I don't know if you saw today. They had a um, ex NFL player uh, killed himself, and like he, I think he killed five or six people. What? It was a couple months ago. Oh. Uh, went in. Uh, went into this doctor's house. Killed the like basically killed a couple people and then like killed like a five-year-old and a nine-year-old and turned the gun on himself. Damn. What the um, and they, when he killed himself, I guess he didn't shoot himself in the head. Uh, they took his brain. They went through all the processing, uh, figured out he had was stage two for the CTE. Hmm. And, you know, they've rated it from like one, two, three, and four, um, you know, which they can only really classify you after death and, you know, post-mortem and autopsy. But as I was, you know, laying there like in the hyperbarics, I'm like, you know, like trying to read through a bunch of stuff and uh, that pops up and I'm like, ooh, you know, and then we had, we had Dr. Joe on the podcast talking about how, you know, in terms of like, uh, so what happens in the hyperbarics is as you go down to these different depths, like two atmospheres, 66 feet, now all of a sudden your body doesn't need, uh, um, basically oxygen can travel on plasma and doesn't need hemoglobin. So it kind of dissolves into the fluids in the body and it mm-hmm. can go everywhere. And, uh, you know, it ends up getting jammed. Oxygen gets jammed into places in the brain that it normally couldn't get to. And so there's like a healing effect by basically oxygenating all these places, especially in the brain. And they feel like it breaks up a bunch of like the tau and the proteins and all the Mm. other stuff that becomes crystallized for the CTE. So Mm. they feel that this is a, you know, pretty solid treatment for people that have TBIs and traumatic brain injuries and are dealing with a lot of these issues. And, uh, yeah, so it was funny. I forwarded him all that and he was like, holy shit. Philip Adams was the the player. This is back in April. Yeah. And then they just released the results of the the CTE scan. Well, what's pretty crazy is I don't even remember reading about this in April. So they did a really good job. Like, I did not see it. Because, I mean, if NFL, like, you just saw Demarius Thomas die, and that that was a big deal. This thing, they did not really publicize it very well until this popped out. So it's not good when, I mean, how old was he? Like, in his mid-30s? 30-something years old? I'm going to mention uh, the hyperbaric to my wife. She fell off a horse a couple of weeks ago, concussion, probably moderate uh, concussion, and she's doing better now, but she didn't, she didn't fully rest like you're supposed to. So we're getting ready to build a house and there's still stuff that needed to be done there. So she was still trying to take phone calls and, and then just trying to power through the, 
the the side effects basically um so she's doing better now but she might might be helped by some hyperbaric oh yeah and i know i mean she, that's what it does yeah. yeah yeah the um i know what we talked about dr joe with recently was he's working with uh, covid patients that are dealing with long haul uh syndrome and it's about five to 12 treatments and all of a sudden everything kind of subsides and goes away nice so I, I know for like, I mean, if I was still playing the NFL with this and this technology, should I'd have one in my house? Yeah. Like every day I'd come home and get in this thing. I mean, it, it sounds like if somebody had the money and the inclination, there could be a, an argument for, and the space for, for anyone to do that. I mean, maybe you don't need to be as aggressive. You don't have to spend as much time in it as you are spending right now. I'm sure there's kind of a general maintenance protocol that is no. less demanding. No. So the it's all, only re- it's... You, the only research that's been done was done by the Navy, and the protocol they picked was 40 dives. So nobody's done any research on any other protocols. And the only and about three years ago, no, that doesn't mean there aren't other protocols though, right? Like so, uh, like a a deep subject matter expert could make some speculation or some predictions based on I'm guessing, unless not, unless it's like, hey, no, if you're not willing to spend. No, uh, we had the expert on the podcast, and he's like, okay. we don't know because one, there's no funding for it. So he's like, if I do a, a group of N of four or five people, he goes, there's, it, you know, one, it's, uh, you got to have the technology. It's not necessarily easy. The cost yeah. is high. So to yeah. be able to go and do a legit study double blind with thousands of people just doesn't exist. So the only yeah. study that they really have is the one the Navy did. And then three years ago, a, pub, a study got published in Israel where the guy was using with older people, but he was doing like 60 dives. And like 17% of them were basically developing like cataracts and other issues, which is a side effect. So, I mean, he's really that, that guy in Israel and that study is about the only other one. And it's actually more aggressive than the Navy one they, they've done. Mm-hmm. And so we had Dr. Joe, who's pretty much the expert right now. And he's the Navy's guy. Uh, he's like, we don't know just because we don't have large enough subject size to necessarily test other protocols. So they're actually going through different protocols right now. Uh, to basically be able to go through and do the testing. But he's like, you know, a, a study's 2 to $5 million, and yeah. the drug companies have no interest in funding this stuff. Of course. Because why would it's they? actual legitimate life extension. Uh, that they can't make money off of, so why would they bother? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, case studies will probably come out, and th- those have uh, those have legitimacy. It's obviously a lower form of evidence, but even, even anecdotes uh, can contribute to the body of evidence. Uh, that's often obviously where... A lot of things start is clinicians, people on the front lines, they think of ideas, they try them, they notice effects, they pass them along, and eventually that becomes well known enough to warrant further research and so forth. Yeah, the the bigger issue though is there's also a lot of charlatans in the hyperbaric world because ah. the uh, the units have to be not only steel tanks, but they have to be done with pure oxygen. And the ones you see at the mall are usually like soft chambers that are just basically pumping in air from the outside, which mm-hmm. has zero effect. So when most people go and they, you know, it's actually like medical grade, you need a prescription to necessarily do the hyperbarics properly. Mm-hmm. So when you, you know, you go to the mall or you Google hyperbarics and you go into some, you know, uh, place that does facials and lasers and they're putting you in a soft like bubble, sure. it does nothing. So like you legitimately have to have a doctor. You have to go into the to- iron lung. <laughs> yeah. It, it's like a tube, like a metal yeah. tube, like a space, like a, like a, a metaverse tube. Like a small submarine is what it, is what it looks like to me, and that's where you get stuck for any minutes. And uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's pretty interesting because I've had a ton of people hit me up and they're like, "Oh, I've done hyperbarics," and then they'll tell me about it. I'm like, "Yeah, no, somebody just built you for money, dude." Because yeah. there's zero. Like basically, what they're doing is they're showing you the research on this side and then giving you something that's it's like being like, "Hey, eat a high protein, you know, uh, um, nutrient dense diet." Okay, but yeah, eat this other meat, you know the. Uh, What's the fucking fake meat? But beyond or oh beyond. yeah, beyond meat. Yeah, yeah. They're like, oh, there no, are a be- couple of them, right? Impossible. Yeah. That's another one. Yeah, it's fucking bullshit. So yeah, of course. So, dude, uh, it's been a little bit since we've talked. So, what have you been up to? Oh, um, other than moving, esca- yeah, escaping the Beltway. Uh, that was uh, that was good. And working away, I have a new book coming out in January on January 11th, which I'm excited about. I think it's gonna. It's called Muscle for Life and. I think it has the potential to to be my most most successful book because it's for men and women, and particularly for the forty plus crowd, particularly for people who have a lot of weight to lose. 
or who are very out of shape, who have not lifted weights before you, you take somebody who's 55 years old and let's say for them to get to a healthy body comp, they're going to have to lose 50 plus pounds and they've never touched a barbell in their life. If you were coaching them personally, you would not say, all right, um, what I want you to do is go into the gym and I want you to squat, deadlift, bench press, <laughs> overhead press, and work out about, you know, 80% of your one rep max. Just do that. No, of course not. You would, you'd probably start them with some walking and then you'd work up to some body weight stuff and maybe some bands and dumbbells. And, and ideally you would work them into proper strength training. But, um, so, so my existing books like bigger, leaner, stronger, for example, it's written more for a, a younger crowd and it assumes that people are ready to, uh, squat, deadlift, bench press, overhead press and, and start at appropriate weights. But but still, those exercises do require a bit of mobility and fitness, uh, even if it's uh, just a base level, you know? Yeah. yeah and Muscle for Life also the title of your podcast. Yeah. And, I mean, yes. you're, you're pushing. I, I had a website, app. too. Look yeah. at that branding. Look how smart you are. I know. You're, 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 dude, you're killing it in the metaverse. <laughs> oh, I mean, you're pushing over 800 episodes here, making us look like kids. Well, he's doing seven a week. I mean, every day. Three. It's, Three. It's, Oh, is it? I thought you were doing, you know, but I mean, isn't it just you like holding the camera, talking to yourself, driving in the car? Uh, no, no, I've never done I'm that. I'm kidding with you. Yeah. Like, I, uh, when I, well, I almost, that was basically what it was when I, <laughs> when I started. When I started years ago, podcasts weren't as popular generally and as polished as they are now. And so I didn't give it much thought. I didn't care to even look professional. I just, I had a webcam in, in my office and I would just turn it on and ramble for like 45 minutes until I ran out of ideas uh, and turned it off. And that was basically it and just posted the, uh, the audio files. And it was, it was a bit of luck in terms of timing because the podcast space was not as glutted as it is now. And you didn't have to have anything great to, um, to, to get listeners. So now, it's, now it's, it's a little bit, a little bit more professional. Yeah, it's a little more competitive, a little, little more saturated. Yeah. Well, you still find a way to get creative. Uh, what are some of the guests that you've recently brought on that really revigorated the the passion for the podcast to then deliver to the the Legion fans? Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the the material I produce is just me. It's it's just uh, monologues. I would say it's probably at least two thirds of it is me. Maybe maybe half of it is interviews, and. Um, I, I do that for a couple of reasons. One is, is, is a marketing reason. I think that from a marketing perspective, it's better to have someone listen to me than listen to a guest, right? Uh, because good interviewing mostly is just shutting up and just not, not saying much of anything. And if you say too much, then people are always like, why can't you just shut up? Why can't you just let them talk? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we've never gotten that before. What? <laughs> I was bad. I was bad in the past. I've gotten better, uh, now, but, but I used to, I used to interject way too much. Now, now I'll, I'll take little notes and I'll try to, you know, just stay quiet. I'll only interject if maybe they're going off to something else that I, before they go off, I wanted to say something, you know, but, um, in, in terms of, of guests, more recent, uh, people I spoke with, I had an interesting discussion, not health and fitness, uh, a marketing related discussion with a guy whose work I had been following for a long time named Flint McLaughlin and, um, very interesting guy, very successful in particularly in conversion rate optimization. Uh, he, he's been doing that for, I don't know, 30 years now, and worked with with a lot of big companies and done some very interesting big tests. I mean, I think his resume is it's like over fifteen thousand conversion tests that he's done over the years. Um, and working with big companies, so well funded, he had a big team. He has since sold that business, and now he has a smaller team. And he still does it, but he's a little bit more picky with, I guess, um, well, very picky with with the projects he takes on. But I, I like I like marketing, and he has a book as well called Marketing: The Marketer as Philosopher, I believe. Yep, and, just um, pulled it up here. Yeah, yeah that 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 was a fun discussion. I read his book before it, and it's one of the better marketing books that I've read in a while. Not not for novices, I would say you, you're going to want to have some experience and marketing chops to to really understand it. But um, that that interview was was fun, and. Um, uh, I had Menno Henselman's on. I don't know if you guys have hit him. If you haven't, you should have Menno on. He's a cool dude. And he has a book out recently on the, I forget the name of it. It's on self-control and it's very practical. 
And in each chapter, there are a lot of chapters where he goes over some research and gives a practical takeaway for um, improving willpower and discipline and self-control. And a lot of the examples that the context is health and fitness, because that's, that's how he's known. But uh, a lot of the advice that is shared is applicable to, to anything, not just health and fitness. Is uh, where you moved in Ocala, uh, is it still pretty kind of rural or is there a lot of kind of transplant people in that area? So I've only been here since April. So my experience is limited and my routine is pretty, uh, I mean, I go to the gym and I work and that's about it. I drive to the gym, I drive home. So I haven't, I haven't experienced, uh, too much that the, the greater area has to offer, but where I'm at is, I mean, the whole area, I guess, is fairly rural once you get outside the city. Sure. Um, and the area that I guess there are, there are a few different kind of pockets and they, they have different characters, I guess you could say. So the area that I'm in is a lot of the horse farms. And so it's pretty, uh, it reminds me more of Virginia than, than Florida. The Florida I grew up with is beach and palm trees and, um, uh, rundown buildings and homeless people everywhere. Like Florida on the whole is, is not, not a, not a nice state, uh, for, uh, there are nice areas, but, uh, there are, I th- from, from my experience, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot more shittier areas than nice areas. Yeah. So. So Ocala is not shitty, this area where I'm in, and it's, you, you have some undulation, you have a lot of green, not a lot of people. Um, and the people I have met, a lot of them are nice, are, are down to earth. Um, and, and there are very, very few COVIDians here. People generally do not care about COVID. They don't even talk about it. So I, I see very few masks and, uh, again, get vaccinated, don't get vaccinated. People don't care. They, they're not going to ask. They don't even talk about COVID. So, uh, it's, it's nice in that regard. And that, that's a, that's a big change obviously from the beltway. Yeah. No, I have a buddy who uh, just moved from the Midwest down to Fort Myers, kind of Sarasota area. So he's been there for a couple months and he's been looking for a place. And he called me yesterday and he's like, dude, uh, these homes, like as I've been going through it, you know, two years ago, this home was selling for five, six, seven hundred thousand. Now they want two, you know, two million dollars for it. And I'm like, what did you yeah. expect? You thought you were going to get late to the party and fucking, you know, get a deal. And, uh, he was like kind of him and on. And I made an interesting point to him. I'm like, dude, just know in real estate, like today's overpay is tomorrow's deal. So like, uh, you know, you either, you know, bitch, especially, about it, especially in, in Florida, people keep coming. I just yeah. saw a headline, um, a couple of days ago that Florida is still one of the biggest net gainers. And uh, the, there were some predictions just really predicting the obvious. Um, I, I, I'll be surprised if in the States, it's going to be obviously mostly loose States, but the States that are still uh, uh, hysterical about COVID, COVID, I will be genuinely surprised if there are no restrictions in three to five years, like take California or New York. I, I, I will, I will be surprised if the politicians there give up COVID. I, I don't know. I don't know if I'd say ever, that's a long time, but I would say within the next 10 years, I will not be surprised if 10 years from now, Californians and New Yorkers are still dealing with COVID related restrictions unless uh, I unless we, politicians I, I agree with you start dying if politicians start dying then maybe things will change but uh, until then eh. i think the one interesting thing is people don't or so let's just to say the government and politicians don't give back power uh if, if anything like you just saw i just saw gavin newsom in california they're going to go back to mandatory yep. uh you know mass restrictions inside and in this i mean it's uh for what i mean they haven't had a spike you know, the uh, Omicron variant is proven to not be deadly. And I mean, it's just, you know what? We got to fucking shake things up and show. Are, are we charge. not all dead yet? Oh, uh, that's right. OK. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's it, it's legitimate. Like uh, and, and I know what Gavin Newsom's deal is. Uh, you guys tried to recall me. So now I'm going to fucking make you guys all hate me. And uh, or I'm, I'm going to show you who's in charge. We're going back to mass. Uh, he just dude just put out a thing where they're going to try to file, you know, use Texas's um kind of interesting kind of take on the abortion law where they're like, you know, we're not saying it's illegal, but we're removing the liability for doctors to be sued for, you know, doing abortions. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Supreme court kind of upheld the state's right to make that decision, you know, however you feel about it. 
And so he's like, hey, we're going to take that same approach and take it to guns. And, uh, you know, now if, uh, you know, you own a gun and you know, it, it was pretty interesting how he's kind of couching it, but it's almost like Gavin Newsom's fucking pissed that they tried to recall him. So now he's just going to lock it down even fucking more. For the first time ever, California lost a, a delegate seat in the House. Yep. So the mm-hmm. population. Yeah. People can't leave that place fast enough. And they're, if they're not going to Florida, they're coming to Texas. I mean, our property yeah. values of like. Montana. That'd be a nice place. The problem is people from California don't want to go there because it's fucking cold. Well, they're about to get frozen out. Yeah. Dude, uh, it, it, believe me, Montana is beautiful until you go through a, a winter and you got to really be prepared for that shit. I'm out. Uh, I mean, as you know, you've lived in some gnarly winters and I have too in Philly and also in the Midwest. And that's a whole different level of winter. So you got to be ready for that stuff. Yeah, I've, I've only experienced Virginia's winter and that's very mild. Yeah, oh, you it? have some. Yeah, you have some cold weather. At least where I was at, and I, I would, sh- I would guess the entire state, unless unless you're up in the mountains, then you're going to get more of it. But uh, where I was at, it actually was nice. I that that's one thing. Not that I really care, but I I don't even know if I'd say I miss about Virginia. But if uh, I don't particularly like Florida's climate, and I did like Virginia's climate because you had four seasons, um, and the summer was it got hot, but it wasn't it wasn't too long, so it wasn't too in Florida, it just gets obnoxious after six months of uh, living in a nuclear reactor. Basically, you're just ready for some cooler weather. And then on the flip side in Virginia, the winter was uh, you got it got into the teens at night um, and you got some snow, uh, maybe a few inches, uh, probably no more than the, when I left that, that the winter, the, the last winter I had there. I remember two or three snowfalls, just enough to be pretty, but not get in the way of anything. And, and then of course you had an actual fall and actual spring. Uh, but I have been, of course, I've, I've, I've been skiing. I've been in, um, Wyoming, you know, when it, when it's really winter and you get some nights when it's minus 30 and I don't mind cold weather, but that, that, yeah, I mean, it gets, it, when it gets so cold that you're walking outside for, after five minutes, your any skin exposed hurts. Like your face is now hurting. Well, I mean, you just, I guess you gotta, you gotta have some grit to make it through months and months and months of that. Yeah. I went to, to school in Northern Virginia and didn't see snow until college. And I mean, the snowstorms made it fun, but like living through that and having months of that versus like, ah, this is a fun three days. No way. I'm out. And, and you go to Montana or you go to Wyoming. You, I mean, you might wake up to six feet of snow, <laughs> not, not four inches. Oh, is, is my car going to slide? Did they ice, did they uh, de-ice the road? They put the salt well, down. And, yet? and the, the thing that people don't re- uh, realize, and I, I know this because people were um, one of our buddies, Derek Woodsky, who's from Canada, uh, pretty remote part of Canada. He moved, um, you know, went to college up there and then went back to Montana recently and he's like a lot of these people that didn't grow up in this climate. There's a whole bunch of things they don't know. Like one, um, you know, if you live on a fire road, those roads aren't managed. So nobody's going to plow those. And so like nobody's coming by to plow your snow. When you kind of live out in the country, you have to ba- basically plow your own snow, manage your own roads, which requires, you know, equipment and machinery and a certain skill set to live a little farther out. And you're on, you know, septic and, you know, all these other different kind of elements that add more complexity more so than just picking up a phone and calling the power company or the water company. So I think people get this idea that they're going to go live out and go back to nature, not realizing that there's a certain skill set to live in nature. And especially today, like, Hey, if you got to drive a mile down some fire road that doesn't get managed, do you have the vehicle for it? More importantly, do you have the skill set? Can you get out? I mean, it's a, uh, it, it's a little bit more than just, um, you know, we're going back to nature. I mean, nature can be a fucking motherfucker. That's why a lot of the, the California moneyed, uh, they they have gone to Jackson, Wyoming. They've gone to Bozeman, Montana. These are these are the um, the, where, the places where you have all of the modern conveniences and everything's taken care of. And then they get to they get to pretend like they're cowboys. It's kind of funny actually to see some of these people. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, um, Ken Ford has a place about thirty minutes south of uh, of uh, Jackson, and uh, I mean, Wyoming is a bitter. I mean, it's it, it's a, a lot more extreme in terms of temperature and climate than, than Montana. I yeah. mean, it's a pretty inhospitable place. I've, I've skied in Jackson Hole, and yeah, uh, it's by far one of the most kind of beautiful and scary aggressive places I've ever skied. 
yeah, it's a tough mountain if, yeah. if uh that that's where i skied for the first time ever actually so not the best mountain to learn on but uh i just didn't didn't do anything stupid and so i you know i, I made my way and I, I grew up playing ice hockey though. So I was able to pick it up probably faster than maybe the average person because it skiing does feel a lot like skating on big, you know, with big clown skates, basically. I remember uh, when we, I was in high school, we had um, uh, like different trips. We took, we went to Salt Lake city, we went to Jackson hole on a fucking bus. And I remember uh, our deal was always skiing out of bounds. We'd always try to find like some extreme yeah. shit to do. And I remember when they prepped us, when we went to Jackson Hole, they were like, hey. Dice with death. Uh, the guy was like, don't ski out of bounds. Don't do anything stupid because you're going to a glacier. It's 10,000 foot. And nobody will ever find you. Like that happens all the time. Don't ski out of bounds. And we were like, oh, shit. Sure enough, we're like, okay, we'll stay within the, the fucking groomed area. We're not going to try to carve out and go out and do something stupid. But yeah, that was a, yeah, we, we were dumb enough to probably fall down a crevice. Yeah. When uh, I was there, I was in Jackson, let's see, a couple of summers ago. And, uh, we, we did the snake river, um, white, white water rafting thing. And that was fun. And the, our, our, our guide, he, w- I guess what he does in, in the winter, he was explaining, he straps skis to his back and then he climbs up mountains and then skis down them. And that's all back country and not, not, not too concerned about the risk. He said he, he loves it and he can't wait to do it again. How many times do you think you can do that before you just die? Eh. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty fucking cool. I mean, or those dudes doing helicopter skiing. I mean, yeah. uh, when uh, we were in Newport Beach, Wendy Zomer and her husband, he was like CFO for Volcom. Uh, he and like Hobie and these guys like went on some bitch and like helicopter skiing. I mean, they basically the helicopter, you jump out 10 feet and then they're carving down these amazing tracks. And he had a GoPro and I was like, holy shit. It was uh, it was pretty epic. I think that's if you're going to do it. I mean, it's a lot better than climbing up. Let's just take a rent a helicopter to get up to the very top. I, you know, that sounds like a better way, but the way the guy's doing it with skis on his back and climbing is fucking awesome. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I guess you, you have a story to tell. I don't quite understand that type of stuff. I mean, in this case, he he's a young dude, doesn't have a family, probably had a girlfriend. He can go fall into a, uh, fall off of a cliff and it's it's too bad but um there, there didn't seem to be anybody really uh, relying on him for anything right but if you have a family and if you have something to lose i don't quite understand the uh adrenaline chasing type of behavior so did you guys go to florida specific for the horses or were there other places that you were looking to move and you just liked florida um yeah, it came about it came about pretty randomly actually. So COVID begins, uh, and my wife then she rode horses when she was a kid, and then she gets back into it. We're in Virginia, and there's a place like an hour away. She was driving one way to to start riding. I think she initially was looking for something to do with our daughter, um, and thought, hey, maybe I can bring her to a, a farm or and she could ride like a little pony or something right and this is the scam this is this is the exact same scam my wife started like like, like yeah like this let's get the daughters into this in the playbook yeah. of the uh equestrian community. i was like are, are our wives this is friends? how you get suckers yeah i was gonna say i think our wives are friends on facebook or something because uh, <laughs> this is exactly the story of my life yeah i mean hey don't uh it, don't don't fix what uh what isn't broken right yeah. And, and it, it, it worked. So, so she gets into it. Right. And then, and then she's spending time there and, uh, we get one horse and it's, it's now boarded there and get another horse and that's boarded there. And, uh, COVID is, is obviously just intensifying. And at first, so when it first began, I, I was telling my wife, I was like, unfortunately, um, I, I don't think this is going to be going away anytime soon, uh, if ever. And I would not be surprised if, if evidence comes out that this was, this virus was engineered and leaked. And, and this is, this is just in line with my general worldview is why I was predicting these things. And I was like, so my point was saying all these things. And I think, I think things are about to get bad is what I was saying. And I don't think living in the beltway makes a lot of sense. We already don't particularly like being in the 
in the suburbs and we don't really connect with a lot of our neighbors and it might be time to, to really look at going somewhere else. And so then the horses are in the picture and then we, she, my wife finds a house that went up for sale in Ocala and uh, there, uh, it was the, the only house actually for sale in Ocala that, that we would have wanted to even consider buying. Right. It was nice. And, and then she learned about Ocala in terms of um, the equestrian activity here. And I don't know if you know, but there's, it's called the world equestrian center and some rich guy, I don't know, but some rich guy, he has spent over a billion dollars. I guess his wife is very involved as well. So this family, this rich family, they've spent over a billion dollars of, of their money to, to build what is basically a theme park. I guess it's like the pre premier equestrian facility in the world. And so they hold horse shows there and they hold also like, dog shows and all kinds of stuff there now, right? There's a hotel, they're building two more hotels, there are restaurants, it's impressive. It's yeah. what you'd expect a billion dollars gets you. <laughs> well, or uh, uh, a little known fact in another life when I was an NFL player, I owned resources. Huh. And I got into, I, I got kind of pulled into this interesting kind of tax shelter deal where I ended up with a bunch of resources and then the, the, the IRS changed the law and then I really ended up with a bunch of resources. So I had to get really into the racehorse business and uh, take my horses and sell them at auctions. One of uh, them was in Ocala. And so, you know, uh, in Kentucky. And uh, it was a very stressful point in my life where I basically got into the horse business on told I wouldn't have to do much other than X. And then that fucking changed. And then I was legitimately in the horse business. I'm meeting with trainers. I'm, you know, talking to doctors and, you know, there's wellness a, and checks. it's a tough business. There are yeah. a, a lot of uh, a lot of dishonest people. Yeah. And what was wild was actually uh, one of the horses I sold ended up running in the Oaks and she ended up winning. So oh, wow. that was, I was pretty fortunate in that deal. But uh, because of that, I've been just very apprehensive. I mean, uh, I know a fairly decent amount of horses having owned them and, you know, going with breeders and especially, you know, viewing this and doctors and whatnot. So it's kind of funny. Now it's con come full circle. And now my wife and my daughters ride and uh, they're always like, uh, yeah, dad, what do you think of that horse? I'm like, ah, oh, it's got good confirmation in this. And we're kind of going through all this stuff, but, uh, yeah, no, I've been to Ocala and I've basically, I've been to auctions and then I, I spoke for Ken Ford at the Institute of Human and Machine Cognition, which is in Ocala. He's also got one in Pennsylvania or, um, uh, in Pensacola. And, uh, as I was driving around seeing like all the horse properties and remembering having been there, it's, uh, you know, I mean, if you're not, it, it's basically, uh, like, if you're not in Kentucky, it's that part of Florida. This I I pulled up this place. This World Equestrian Center is insane. Yeah, this is it, amazing. It is it is pretty wild for for you know. I, I go there. I'm not interested in, but I can still appreciate all of the all of the work that has gone into that that thing and all of the stuff that they're doing, it's pretty cool. And it's great for, for property values. Uh, Ocala is changing quickly. I mean, according, so, so I bought this property, well, to finish the story, John. So we pass on the house, uh, because primarily because it wasn't going to appraise, they had give us, they had given us a heads up. It was not going to appraise even close to what they were asking. So really what they wanted is they wanted a, a cash buyer who saw the value in it and, could care less what it what it appraises at, right? And um, so we pass on that. But then we find something that I actually like more. We have to build what we want, but I like the location more. I like the property more. the The house we passed on is very close to that WEC facility, um, but it's also on a road that gets a lot of traffic. So you hear a lot of that traffic, and that that was a two lane road. Now it's going to be a four lane road, and so it's going to be even more traffic. And so we we buy this uh, property and we really we really wanted it for the land and according to zillow which is a, a conservative estimate it has gone up um about 30 percent since april <laughs> nice. good move. my wife my wife is getting calls or she was uh i don't know in the last week or two but she was getting calls from realtors who i guess were going online into online databases like public records who owns this piece of property and then online databases what are their numbers 
uh, and then calling my wife, not me, which I guess makes sense. Maybe they thought that they could get her hyped up to want to sell it, but saying, Hey, um, we have cash buyers. How much do you want? What, what's your price? And we're not interested in selling, but that that's, what's going on in Ocala right now. Yeah. It sounds like, sounds like where we are in, uh, in, in Austin as well. I mean, there's, you know, uh, every day we get some form of some phone call, some mailer, you know, somebody mm-hmm. calling you on the phone. Do you want to, you know, cause we have a, a 16 acre horse property. And so, oh, cool. and we're also four minutes from the Galleria, uh, which is like where whole foods and all like the cool shit is. Nice. So yeah, no, we get the same deal. People, um, do you like Austin? I heard there are a lot of Californians and a lot of uh, obnoxious yeah. millennials and uh, when we originally moved out here, we thought we were living in the country. And then in the last three or four years, they pretty much just like built the city to us. You know, they put 800 homes up the road and 300 homes in our backyard. So they're basically building all around us. But what's cool is uh, the way my property is designed, we're dug down. So we don't see any of that. And oh, that's cool. uh, yeah, like it's, it's really like when people come to our place or like, wow, like you wouldn't know what, what's going on around you. Whereas my neighbor's on top of the hill and he, his view, he walks out and he has to see all of this. So, uh, I, I do like Austin. Mm. Uh, the only other place that I would have moved, uh, when we left California was, I would have gone back to Tampa where I lived in Tampa for five years. I did like that area. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard uh, good things about Dallas, but, I, I, I don't oh, even know. Man. If I There's so much concrete in uh, Dallas and I'm from hate, Houston. I hate Dallas. Yeah. Every time I drive there, I'm like, this place is fucking ugly. It's like, it is a suburb. So you have this beautiful downtown, all the highways cutting through, and then it's just concrete suburb. Where Austin, you have like hills lakes, and, greenery, yeah. and oh, it doesn't cool. feel like a big city. Dallas, like as soon as you, I mean, the downtown's the downtown, but as soon as you leave that, it's like where, where is anything? Everything is a like chain, subdivision. Yeah, yeah, like a chain restaurant, store, mm-hmm. subdivision, where Austin has well, uh, mom and pop. Sounds and, like kind of like Orlando. Yeah. Uh, that, it, that's an amazing, yeah. yeah. So what's cool about Austin, where we are, is, uh, and I think the reason from people from California come here, is it feels a lot like Central California, like Santa Barbara area. You're driving mm-hmm. through in the hills. And at least to me, you know, growing up like in Palos Verdes, and then you drive down to Laguna and kind of that whole area, it kind of feels very familiar. People come here and they're like, oh, this feels familiar to where, you know, this part of California. And so I think people feel uh, like connected when they come here and they're like, Oh, I could live here. And we know it by the amount of, you know, Rolls Royce and Bentley SUVs I see driving around. There's a neighborhood out by me that is named Cali Terra yeah. and they're marketing. <laughs> it's no secret <laughs> towards those yeah. folk. I know that's, that's so on Fun. the nose, but I guess, uh, I guess if it works, it works. Well, the, the Cali. Funny thing, I, I joke with, with Texas, like Cali, whenever that's like when people, when, when they say, uh, Los Angeles, like, Oh, where do you live? Oh, I live in Los Angeles, like uh, Cali. Those are, those are, uh, I don't think I've ever heard anybody ever say the word Los Angeles other oh, yeah. than people that aren't from Sports. LA. I don't know. I mean, it's just always been LA. Yeah. Nobody wants to even go there anymore. Jesus. That's even more hipster though. It, what you to know, say LA? It, yeah, exactly. Oh, nah. like you're you're a real Los Angelan if you say oh Los Angeles yes well, the, the people uh, that nah, say that's... Los Angeles there's the same people that say where are you from Austin Texas you just oh, say okay. you're from Austin we yeah. all know know that it's in Texas yeah or well, you could actually, just say Texas we don't really need to yeah know Austin, but but, but nobody really lives in Los Angeles or or Northern Virginia they would say because they don't want to say Virginia they're too sophisticated for that they would just say DC but uh, that, it, yeah, it's true there. like nobody lives in Los Angeles. Like uh, I grew up in Torrance, which is in the in the South Bay, Palos Verdes area. And well, like, some people some, live in in the in the streets, you know, in the tents. Yeah, stuff. I mean, if you live on you know uh, fucking Skid Row or you're like live downtown, but then anybody would say, "Hey, I live downtown." Like I don't know anybody. <laughs> if I ever met anybody, it's like, "Oh, I live in Los Angeles." I'd be like, "Where?" Like, what do you live in the valley and you're afraid to uh, you know admit it? So yeah, yeah. that's a that's an interesting one. I never thought about that, and having grown up there, but. Yeah, it's uh, it's weird. Um, the amount of like uh, out of state license plates uh, that I've seen within the last six months is like exponential, and the traffic is exponentially mm-hmm. growing to the point where I'm driving around like, like and, you know, it, it's like the the perception. I'm like, well, you know, six months ago it took me this long to get here. Now all of a sudden it's added fifteen minutes, and you're like, holy shit, where are these cars coming from? That's the Tampa Bay area now. I was I was surprised when because I, I after, when I left I left probably about five years ago I would I would go now and then but I was there 
I'm there more frequently now. A lot of the a lot of the people I work with are actually in the Tampa Bay area, and it is. Where'd you live in Tampa? So I lived in Clearwater. Well, I guess Where, I guess technically it's Bel Air, like the little golf community by. So I used to live in Safety people. Harbor. Okay, so yeah, that that, that area, right? Yeah. So that whole area extending into Tampa is is and this is not surprising of course given just the the migration numbers but it is busier than ever i mean um, i'm sure you've done that drive to clearwater beach right and yeah. recently recently the the line it was a saturday the line on on gulf to bay you know that's how you have to get over there mm-hmm. it was it was past us 19 and for anybody listening i mean that's i don't even know that's you're, it's gonna take two hours to get to the beach that people dude and that was at like 11 a.m so we were living in Hyde Park. So I, I, I had a place in Hyde Park and we would go over to Clearwater Beach. And I remember driving to Clearwater Beach and being like, fuck, this is too far. And yeah. then I uh, ended up meeting some of the Yankee guys. I met David Wells and they all lived over in that Safety Harbor area. So I, I went over and I bought a place mm-hmm. that uh, had a view of like the backside of the bay. And it was cool because I'd sit out on my balcony and like see Lund- uh, you know, lightning hit the water and it was fucking awesome. And I kind of, but it was cool because when you come across the causeway, you make that first right and go down to Safety Harbor. And I never had to like go the far distance unless I was yep. planning to go there, whereas other people had to go. So I figured it was a good spot. And uh, it's funny because I still have the address saved on my Redfin. So I still watch it and I know what I mm. sold it for. And I'm like, fuck, I should have kept that place. <laughs> you know? Actually, I, I thought recently to check my, my house in Virginia. I mean, I, I sold it for, um, Let's see about 20% more than I, than I paid, which is great for, for living there for a few years. But I'm curious, let's, let's see what Zillow says now. So what I do is I go and I save uh, addresses in Redfin and then sure. it'll give me like little updates. I did it for Chris's house too. So yeah, which is it, great. Yeah, no, I mean, it, 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 it's always good to feel like you're an early adopter opposed to the phone call I got yesterday where it's like, I can't find anything. And I'm like, uh, you're a couple years too late, dude. You're late to the party. You're going to have to overpay. That's, that's, again, that's, uh, that's Ocala. It's, I, I got it. I guess I got lucky. I got in at, I mean, the, a better time would have been any time before when I got in, of course, sure. but I got something that is in a very desirable location because everybody wants to be close to that equestrian facility. And they also want to be close to a country club nearby, a golf and tennis and swimming and stuff. So it's, it's the Northwest areas where people want to be. And so that's, that's where I'm at. And it it was actually kind of interesting. So, um, the guy I I got bought the place from, I never met him, but he did not list it, which if he would have listed it, he would have definitely got more money. He had his asking price. I, I, I threw through the realtor that I was working with offered him three or 400,000 less than he was asking, because what I was saying is. I just want the land. The house has no value to me. I want to get rid of the house. And so I don't want to pay what, what you're asking. And so, um, we, we agreed on a price that was like a hundred K more than, so he, he's gone down almost 300 K now, a hundred K more than my initial offer. He did not put it on the market. Uh, I waived all contingencies cause I didn't care about the house really. I mean, I'm fine. It was good enough. I know I was going to be in it for a few months, but I wasn't too concerned. And, um, closed quickly and, and then moved on. And I was wondering like, wh- why did this guy do that? Why, why did he not just tell me to pound salt and just put it on the market? Cause he, he would have almost certainly gotten more than he want was asking. He might've gotten as much as a hundred, 200 K more, maybe mm-hmm. even more than that. If people with money got into a bidding war and, and then, so I'm in the house and, uh, uh open and just opening everything that's in the pile. And one of the, one of the, the letters was for him, not me. And it was from the department of taxation or, or revenue, whatever it's called here in Florida. And so the dude, he, he had sold a jet for, for like $3 million years, a couple of years ago, did not pay his taxes. Mm. If he would have paid his taxes at the time, it would have been 50 K as of months ago, when I opened this letter, he owed 250 K and 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 of course the 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 vig is still still going every single day that he doesn't pay it just it just grows and grows and grows and um and then a month later a letter from the irs comes from him a month later another letter from the uh florida department of revenue or taxation comes and so 
this guy, I guess, is a, is a complete idiot. And I've heard now from other people that, oh yeah, he would buy all kinds of stuff. He, he, his finances are, have always been a mess. And so I guess I lucked out in that, uh, <laughs> he needed money fast and that's why he didn't put it on the market. Or there's dead bodies buried around there. One of the Possibly. Other. But maybe Possibly. you'll find them when you dig them all up, when you go build your new house. That, that, yeah, that's a, that's a feature. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Yeah. You're okay. Uh, so you, you started playing hockey in Florida when you were living there growing up? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of yeah. ca- counterintuitively. Yeah. There's a lot yeah, of hockey here. Surprised me as well. Any plans to uh, like Tampa Bay lightning, they're winning and that's mm-hmm. always good for youth sports. Any plans for your son to get involved in hockey? Um, he hasn't expressed all that much interest in it. Um, he currently he's playing tennis and he likes that. Uh, I could see, ironically, my daughter being more interested in sports in general. My son has fun with sports, but he has not found a sport that he likes enough to really care and want to get into. And I mean, when I found hockey, that's all. So I found I found roller hockey first. And then all I would do outside of school was play roller hockey with my friends in in the neighborhood I was living in. I just loved it. And then from there. I found ice hockey and then loved that. Obviously, that's harder to do than just playing roller hockey with friends. So I would still play a bunch of roller hockey and then I would do all the ice hockey I could, go to camps and blah, blah, blah. And basically as much as my parents could <laughs> could take of, of that. And so I was into it though. My parents never pushed me into it. I was the one wanting to uh, play and get better and practice. And so my son Lennox, I don't, I don't see that with him yet with with any sport and i i don't think it makes sense to to push that too much as a parent i think it makes sense to push them outside not let them like for example i don't uh, my wife and i we don't let our kids uh, no screens aside from right now lennox is working with a tutor over zoom okay fine but no screens during the week we allow them a couple of hours on the weekend that's okay uh, but even on the weekend they're going to be going outside. They're going to be going to the pool. They're going to be doing stuff. And so that, I think it's appropriate to, to quote unquote, force them to not just sit in front of screens all the time and do something else, but to force them into sports. I mean, um, uh, John, I'm sure you, you saw this and I, I'm sure both you guys played sports uh, at, starting at a young age. I, I remember, I don't know about you guys, but I remember kids whose parents we're pushing them and pushing them and the kids weren't having that much fun. And even as a kid, I didn't quite understand like, why, why is this kid here? He doesn't try. He's not even a good teammate. He doesn't really want to be here. He's not having a good time. And it's, it seems like the parents are just doing it for their own satisfaction, I guess. And, and it, they're not, this kid would rather be, be doing something else. And, and I'm okay with that. No, I, dude, I totally agree. I mean, uh, I, I know a lot of the guys that I played high school football with all played like Pop Warner and their dads were coaches and they went on and had a bunch of success. And then all of a sudden we get to high school and uh, they all quit within a year or two. Yeah. You know, they didn't like it. It wasn't fun anymore. And, you know, they weren't playing daddy ball anymore where their dads are their coaches and helping them yeah. along. And it's more, you know, so uh, whereas I like that piece, I'm like, shit, I, you know, I don't want anybody to treat me any different. Just give me the opportunity. And uh, I know for my own kids. Uh, I'm real big on like, you know, like I I think from my perspective, uh, there was a point where I remember where playing sports was fun and then it became a job and then it became like, you know, hey, like, you know, we're paying you to go to college. Uh, You know, this is what we're demanding. And then obviously more when you get to the NFL. So I remember when sports were fun and I remember when you were out there playing with your buddies and, you know, we uh, like the bus stop would drop us off from middle school and then it was right across from my house and then we had a basketball court. Uh, you know, or a hoop on our, in our driveway. And so all my buddies would stop and we would play one-on-one, two-on-two, three-on-three basketball for at least like an hour every day, if not two. And then everybody would break out and we'd go to either baseball practice or whatever we had to do, but we'd ride our bikes. You know, our moms never dropped us off anywhere. And, um, and I remember it always being a lot of fun and like looking forward to playing basketball. Yeah. And it's just a little different now. I know for my kids, like my daughter, um, uh, my daughter, Jamie, she does gymnastics uh, but she just likes a tumbling piece, which for me is like, uh, they wanted to do, they, they wanted both my girls to do more competition stuff, but it's like, they got to go five days a week 
and I'm more into them doing gymnastics more for like the body control and the agility and just like the movement through space. And then she does swimming. So she uh, said, Hey, I want to swim. I I think I, I really enjoy it. And so now she swims like four days a week and twice on Saturday. And then, uh, she also plays basketball two days a week. So, and then we go outside and we play basketball. And so my whole deal is like, they have to do multiple things. Like my other daughter rides horses. So she jumps and rides five days a week and then she does gymnastics and she's got to pick up another sport. So like, I don't want them to specialize and I want them like the gymnastics is like the, uh, the non-negotiable, but they have to go to gymnastics. And even though like, it's pretty interesting, like when they decided not to go into their gold team, they kind of like partitioned them into this like fitness tumbling kind of more enjoyment stuff, which is fine. But I told the guy, I'm like, Hey man, like I'm sending my girls here for not necessarily for uh, the gymnastics, but more for the physical training piece because I see all the carryover it has to other sports. So yeah. like they're 10 years old. I don't want them to less necessarily lift weights yet, but the, the amount of stuff they do in 90 minutes in gymnastics coupled with their other sports, like my daughter, uh, Killy is really, really accomplished rider, even at 10 years old. And I think it's from uh, a lot of the gymnastics stuff she does because her body control is so good. And she's so much physically stronger than the other girls because that's what she does. And yeah. then um, the physical strength is big too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah just just who, like the trunk and the body I, control. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I can't, I can't say I know this firsthand, but I know now with my wife and there are some, some very accomplished riders around here, like Olympic riders. And there, there's a lot going on in terms of isometric and, um, and and just core strength back strength shoulder and arm strength to to ride a horse properly and when somebody's good at it it looks like they're almost doing nothing but a lot is a lot is a lot is going on and it, it's tiring apparently like you need to that's a that's a, its own thing you have to get you have to build endurance for well and and it's really the strength like uh because our properties are connected you know my uh, my building and our gym uh so now my wife trains a bunch of the the younger girls uh, come over and they lift weights at our place. Nice. So my wife uh, has taken them and shown them, uh, you know, how to lift weights and how to train and added that element that I think is so important for those girls. And now all of a sudden, like the lady that owns it and their coaches are like, wow, they're all getting better. I'm like, wow, look at that little basic strength training for girls, helping yep. everything. But yep. I really think, uh, at least for me with the kids, yeah, my little boy's five, like, he, uh, you know, we're doing basketball now and he does swimming and he goes to gymnastics as well. But I want them to do uh, sports say have fun. And if it's not fun, tell me it's not fun and we'll f- find something else. Exactly. And, and I, the, the one thing that's interesting when you run into these other parents, like they're forcing their kids into it. Whereas, uh, I'm coaching like the five-year-old basketball and I'm like, okay, what's the goal or what's the plan? We're going to have fun. I want everybody to smile. I don't want anybody to feel, you know, and just trying to like bring a little bit of joy. And they're, you know, and the parents are like, well, what I'm like, Hey dude, they're five years old. Yeah. Believe me. I, I did this job when it wasn't fun and I remember it being fun at five years old. So don't fucking rob that from these kids. Yeah. And uh, they don't need training programs. Like if we're going to have fun, we're going to have basketball. If they make a shot, who cares? As long as they get to run the court and get to play with their friends, it's all that matters. Yeah. And so when I you think- were in the NFL, uh, was 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 it mostly? Did it feel kind of like work chores? Was was there still a lot of fun? Uh it's um, it's not like you know you and your buddies getting out there and playing pickup. It's more like a uh, uh, fun in terms of like, uh, I'm going to get paid a whole bunch of money to go beat this dude's fucking ass for three hours. Yeah. Like that level of fun. So I think uh, what I appreciated was I, I, I enjoyed the training aspect, like the sharpening of the blade. So I always looked at uh, all the weightlifting, the running, the training, all the shit that sucked was that uh, that was like the preparation and the sharpening of the blade so that I could effectively just take off limbs and heads faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, that was fun to me, you know, like, uh, you know, somebody always asked me, like, was it fun? And I was like, like fun in what type of sense? Like mm-hmm. the sadistic kind of fun that you have from, you know, like a, like, like boxing or fighting. Do you think like a boxer goes in the ring and has fun? Or is he necessarily doing it for, for pride and all the other reasons? So I, I don't necessarily know if it was fun. It sucked to lose. Uh, casting the paychecks was fun. <laughs> um, you know, like there was just a whole lot of like it was a balance. But it, it, it was never as much fun as like coming home at like, you know, 12, 13 years old. And playing pickup basketball with my buddies or even in high school, like, you know, going out and playing with your buddies who you went to a pizza, you know, a pizza party the day before and you were going to go, you know, hang out the next day at the beach. Different, different kind of fun. So, Mike, I coach middle school, high school lacrosse, which blowing up in Florida, man, Tampa especially. But then you notice there's an observation where the kids start 
having fun to them is is win, is be, being good. So their skill increases. And they start going towards that versus just playing grab ass and being with their boys. Yeah. So it's is this change and it hits guys eighth freshman sophomore year different, and some guys not at all. But having fun is now being good at this craft and this yeah. skill. Yeah. No, I mean it, uh, it's not fun sucking. No. Like like that's an interesting one. Like like if you suck at a sport, like I don't know anybody who's really awful. Like uh, uh do you golf? Yeah. I was I was just gonna say golf. I I, I was <laughs> like golf is a great is, example. Golf <laughs> is the only sport I've seen where people have fun really sucking. Oh, I don't. And uh, <laughs> uh like it, it I don't at all. So my dad was a pretty good golfer. And uh, he like we we would go out and play, and he would fucking just literally rag me to be like, oh god. He would think he'd be better at this being a professional athlete, but do you think he could take some lessons? Just literally three hours of backhanded compliments and just fucking diss to the point where I was like, fuck you, old man. I'm gonna hit you with this club. Uh, but like, oh, why you gotta kill the ball? Oh, maybe we should just go to the snack bar early. Just fucking just such a dick about it. And um, it, it, but it's the only time I've ever seen people legitimately go out and have a good time and be awful. Uh, but I, I, which I don't, I don't subscribe. I mean, sometimes it's, it's the alcohol that for, for some people, it is just about getting out there drinking more than it is about playing golf. It's like, uh, it's just social hours and, and then maybe hitting a good shot here and there is just, uh, is just an added bonus. Uh, but yes, there are people who are not drinking and are still having a good time and they're awful. And I mean, they're technically awful meaning their their swings are awful they're not, not good at any part of the game and of course their scores are awful but they they finish up a round of 120 and they're legitimately happy um i'm I, that's that's just not my personality i, I do yeah, not neither. have fun doing anything that i'm bad at so if i'm going to consistently do something i'm either going to get good and good there's a subjective element to that so for me exam for example in both I would say good starts in the eighties. That's where you actually feel like you're playing the oh, game. Sh- I'm way and then, do you, uh, do you consistently cr- uh, crack a hundred every time you go out? So what here, here's my little golf story. So before I left Florida for Virginia, I was, I was consistently probably putting in four to six hours a week. I would get out there usually one long afternoon and, um, I was, I was working a lot of my swing and put a lot of time in that and, and, and put together a pretty good swing. So, uh, as far as scoring goes, uh, or at least getting good, you have to have a long game. You can't just yeah. be good at chipping and putting, right? And uh, it's also easier to get good at chipping and putting than it is at at, at hitting four irons. Um, so, uh, so uh, I, I was putting in a lot of practice, not playing much until I felt like my mechanics were good enough to be good, right? So then I started playing more rounds. And somewhere in the nineties, my best round was an 81 and that's, that's real golf playing from the back tees, no mulligans, no fixing lies, like playing the way you're supposed to. Right. But of course there were, there were 10 stroke variances because I still was learning the game. And even the pros are not uh, as consistent as, as many golfers think they are. They're just generally, of course, shooting a lot better scores, but a, a pro can go out and shoot a 79, for example, it happens. So if people that good, if, if you're talking about like a plus eight can go out and shoot a 79, it just, it just tells you something about the game. And so I was getting to where I was, let's just say more often in the eighties than not. Uh, but I, I could certainly have a bad round because it only takes, uh, it only takes, let's say, an OB drive, which I would do probably once around here and there, just some wild erratic uh, drive that's gone, um, or you know, it just takes a couple of blow up holes, and and that's the difference between shooting an eighty five and like a ninety two, right? Um, so that so I leave Florida, go to Virginia, and then I had a nice setup in Florida, and that the club was nearby, and so so and I had some people to play with Virginia. No, no club nearby, or actually there was one, but I didn't really like it, especially not for the price. I didn't want to join. And uh, so I didn't play golf much for, you know, the four year, five years I was there a little bit, uh, ended up joining a club, ended up joining Trump's club actually, which was, which was quite nice. It just was a bit of a, of a drive back in Florida. Now I'm again, 
now I'm like five minutes from, so I'm getting back into it. So where I'm at now is I would say my ball striking is probably comparable to when I was shooting in the eighties, but my game is not where it was. Not that it was anything great. It's just, I don't have as much time right now that I want to give to it. So I'm kind of limited uh, by that factor. And, and golf is particularly like that. Even if you're, even if you're good, if you don't practice a few times per week, uh, skill degradation gets to you. You, you, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to go out and play your best golf, uh, just doing it, you know, here and there once every seven to 10 days. I remember, uh, I think it was my second year in the NFL. Um, like pain came through and they gave us all clubs. So I got like a bitch and set of match clubs. And so I, I was living down in Tampa at the time and I decided, you know what, this off season, I'm going to get good at golf. So I went like three, four days a week. I took lessons uh, you know, went to the hitting range, which I think the hitting range, like I tell people all the time, like the hitting range is like going to the shooting range, like, uh, or like, you know, welding on the bench, you got to like actually go play, like to figure it out, like just teeing up a shot and working it. And like, it's, eh, it's all right. And I actually got to where I was pretty consistent in like the low nineties, like, like good enough to go out and actually like, yeah, have that's like where you a, feel like yeah. you're playing the game. Like you're not all to, over the place. Yeah. The balls are generally going in the right direction. You thin some, you fat some, you hit some good ones. Yeah. I'd always get like one or two shots where like they were so good that I like, yep. that's what kept me coming back. <laughs> that's golf. And, that is uh, it. I, like, and and if, I, if those shots don't give you that thrill, just yeah. stop playing golf. You're never going to find any real enjoyment in it. So like I, I took it super serious. Like I didn't drink. I'd go out there. Like I, I like to walk the course. Um, you know, like that was like a big thing for me. It was like, Hey, you got to have the stamina to walk the course. And, uh, you know, so it was, it was a lot of fun. And then I went to go back and play that third season. All of a sudden season gets done, come down to Florida, go down and I, I get invited to go play around a golf. I shoot like a one thirty. Yeah. Can't even hit the ball. That's what uh, happens. Dude, it was so fucking bad. Like to the point where I was so embarrassed and the guys I were playing with were, uh, like one of them was a kicker who was like a scratch golfer. So fucking good. And yeah. uh, just to the point where, like, I was, just, it was such an awful experience. I put the clubs away and never really played ever again. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it, it was like one of those days where I was like, you know what? Fuck this game. I'm done with it. Uh, you know, there's there's so many other things I want to learn other than golf. Yep. And so my dad's always like, have you ever thought about getting back into golf? I'm like, come within arm's distance. I'm going to smash you. So, yeah, and that and that's, uh, I, I've had many of those moments as well where I was like, I, there are so many other things I could be doing with my time. I'm not having fun right now so why am i doing this <laughs> this is I'm not, I'm not i'm not trying to compete i'm not trying to get anywhere with this other than just get good enough to have fun and some rounds are so unfun that uh that you, you just recently actually because again i'm not putting enough time i would say i'm putting enough time into it to not get worse but not really enough to get better and so i have a couple of friends who are who are decent and uh, it's not, it's not fun to go out there and suck. It's just not fun. So, and, uh, I feel like if you live in Florida, you have to play golf because people uh, like, it's kind of a social thing. Like I, like I, the whole time I've lived in Florida, I'd have people be like, Hey, you know, we should get together. Do you want to play golf? Since I moved to Texas, I've not had a single person ask me to go play golf. What, what is it there? Shoot uh, hogs or something? Uh, yeah. Like I've had people invite me to go to hunting ranches and like, you know, go kill things. And like, I've, I've been, funny. that was a joke, but you're like, no, oh, yeah, I, yeah, totally. uh, no <laughs> I, I have people with like big hunting properties. I get invited to go sh uh, hunting a lot. Um, I, I have a buddy who constantly invites me to, uh, uh, go do stuff at his place because, uh, I weld and can fix shit. So they're always like, Hey, there's much stuff broken. Can you come kill some stuff and we'll weld some stuff? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Well, so I got a couple holes in my backyard. Mike, I built just my, Short and mid game is terrible. I can drive great just from youth lessons and similar experience with my father. But then I just am too damn strong, Mike. That's what Your I'm doing. Your dad's going a good with. golfer, isn't he? He's amazing. Yeah, yeah, he's he's real good. Um, yeah, just too damn strong, Mike. But but he also travels the world, like travels to all golf. over to golf. Yeah. So he's like, oh, I'm going to Ireland to golf. I'm going to Scotland to golf. I'm going, you know. So he that's travels. the way to do it. If you're yeah. good enough to, and you have the time and the money, I mean, and then you get some friends, and that's a good time. And what's yeah. his deal? He just shows up and looks for a threesome to jump in on? Uh, for traveling. He's, so he's if, he, if yeah. he can't get pals to go, then, I mean, say we go to California for a family wedding. What's the closest golf course? I'm just going to bring my clubs. And then you show, you show up, up and there's yeah. always somebody looking for... Yeah, and if a, you can play, it's you're not a, you're not a nuisance, right? It sucks to play. If you're decent or good and you're playing with somebody who's bad, uh, it, it's, it's very annoying because it makes the round take 
twice as long start there and they're always looking for their ball every hole and that, yeah, that makes it that makes we, it a lot uh, less fun uh, so uh, a couple years ago mike's my, my next door neighbor in newport uh, a guy named joe capucho owns um del mar seafoods so he's like the largest exporter of seafood in the united states uh, angel ocean and does squid and sardine and you just say joe's big money and uh we get invited to his 50th birthday party he rented out this uh huge house in pamia down in Cabo san lucas and uh invited us all down which was cool as shit but he was members uh or he was a member of el dorado country club and uh that's like you know big money you know leonardo dicaprio mm-hmm. and all these you know uh, Clooney and all these guys and so they have a, a golf course and so we go out and we play this is probably the last time i played and we're out there like hitting pretty well and all of a sudden these dudes are like come up on us and uh you can tell they're real good and it was actually the two brothers like uh that own modello and a couple other guys so these are you know billionaires they're playing ten thousand dollars a shot <laughs> And so they a come shot. up. A shot. <laughs> what does that? What does that even mean? Uh, like so. So like they. Whoever hits uh, the longest drive, ten k. Whoever hits the closest yeah. to the pin. Yeah. Like they had. Like they gambled. It was ten k on every shot. Uh, yeah. And then it was like there was a you know each hole you won was fifty k. And then you know shots. And they had a, this whole band gambling thing. So these guys come up on us and they're like, hey, can we play through? And we're like, fuck, these guys are really good. Like they're all like, I mean, everybody's good. So we're like, yeah, fuck, like play through. Like we'll fucking stand aside. So I'm watching yeah. these guys play and they're going through this thing. And they legitimately had cash on them and were changing cash like in 10,000 bundles back and forth on this thing. And I was like, holy <laughs> shit, that's a lot of money. And then Joe kind of tells me who they are. I'm like, oh, fuck, these guys own Modelo. They own this place. And like, you know, and then that guy's this guy and this. And uh, yeah, it was pretty fucking cool. And uh, but I was like, holy shit, like closest to the pin, 10 grand. OK, cool. Like calling shit like that on the par threes. And uh, it was I was like, that would be what, what if, do they call that prop prop bets where it's just like impromptu kind yeah. of ad hoc. Yeah, and then for every one, like every hole, if it was like a three, if it all was right, a par- all right. If you if you if you hit it in, if you fade it in, uh, an extra fifty well, k. It, it was like if it's a par three and you win it, you win thirty. If uh, if it's par four, you win forty. If you you know par five, it. fifty. And then they had impromptu bets, like hey, if you you know closest to the pin, this one, you know, least amount of shots under. I mean, so they had this whole fuck, and then they had their. Uh, like dudes, and they're all betting door. on each other's shots too. I'm sure. Yeah, and, and they're yeah, and like it, it was fucking amazing to watch. Like I if mean, it's a threesome and A is hitting, B and C are betting on A's shot. You know. Yeah, it was it was like five dudes, yeah. and they each had their little handler who was like they, those guys were like keeping track of it with their little <laughs> bundles of money, and uh, and they they had to walk the whole thing. It was it was pretty fucking cool, and I remember thinking like uh, one to have that much money to be able to gamble like this, but two to be that skilled enough. To where you're like you know like uh, to make that happen so that was uh that was pretty neat and then i was like you know what that's a whole different level of golf if we ever get to that point i'll get back into golf that's some rat race shit yeah those dudes are worth a lot of money though i'm out yeah i'm out yeah it was uh yeah it was wild i'm like what are those bundles oh those are ten thousand dollar bundles i'm like holy shit Damn, I mean, just enough so you know where it's like a seven-figure swing probably by the end of the day for somebody which is well i mean you're playing 18 holes you know i mean yeah Freaking MJ, stories of him golfing. Yeah, oh yeah, dude. Uh, I always like Jordan's one where he like went and played like two rounds of golf and drank eighteen beers and then went out and had like a triple double that night. Did you hear that story? He he went out and, like that was uh, not in the Last Dance documentary. No, nah, but there's like a good story on him where he like went and they, he played like two rounds of golf, drank a bunch of beers, and then they went and they played that night and he like had some like insane like hit some record. I got to rewatch, but I think his gamble his up all night gambling. And then going to the NBA or the conference finals in New York was in the dock. I yeah, forget. He's, if, if, <laughs> the story should be. Tiger in there, has some stories like that. Taking taking two weeks off to do military stuff and then not swinging a club for two weeks and then showing up to a tournament, winning, uh, staying up all night, banging some porn star, go to the gym, go to the, you know, play your final round, win the tournament. Go back and bang the porn with star. Or, with or without, uh, yeah, probably. With or without uh, cocaine or meth or whatever, that's still impressive. You know, he uh, when I lived in California, we used to work with a bunch of the guys that were in um, uh, like second phase, which is for uh, buds. And they like their mountain warfare is called La Posta. And uh, I went out there and I'd go shoot with those guys. And uh, I actually met a bunch of their students recently uh, that are, you know, uh, since moved on. But uh, the Tiger Woods used to go out there and shoot a bunch with those guys somehow met him and come out there and shoot so i know he was uh he was serious about it i read a long form piece uh it was an espn long form piece well written i forget the the secret life of tiger woods or something like that and according to to that 
there was a point when, when he was really at his apex in, in golf. I don't remember the exact year, but this is when he was Tiger Woods, the international superstar destroying everyone. Uh, he, he wanted to quit. He wanted to quit and go into the Navy and become a Navy SEAL. And apparently his, his agent talked him out of it. Like he was serious. He was going to do it. He was going to say, yep. I'm done with golf. I'm going to go do that. I'm going to go, I want to learn how to, uh, I'm just going to go. This would have been around 2008, 2009 when they, okay. he was he doing that. But I don't uh, remember the year I read that it was, I read it probably two years ago or something, this piece, but. Well, the interesting one is, uh, you know, his wife obviously catches him cheating and, uh, she fucked him up pretty good. And that was like the whole like kind of you know tipping point. But I uh, wasn't it like Charles Barkley and MJ and a bunch of those dudes were coaching him on how to like live the secret life. They introduced it. They 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 used him. Yeah, no, they it was it was Barkley and uh, Jordan who introduced yeah. him to the to the life of grime. I, there's a story right of yeah. so uh, Tiger goes to Vegas with them maybe for the first time or something like that, right? And and I think Jordan tells the story and Tiger asks him. Hey, and this was before he's married. Hey, uh, so how do I, how do I talk to women? Like, I see you're so good with women. How do I do that? And Jordan was like, you go up to them and you say, hi, I'm Tiger Woods. And he's like, oh, okay. Uh, and, and so that's what he did. And he learned very quickly that that worked re really well. And uh, I guess the rest is history, as they say. Yeah. He got a little too far outside of his skis. There was, uh, yeah. Yeah. Clearly. I mean, yeah. Uh, you, it, it makes me think of, um, it's a little bit different, but uh, what's his name? The, the barstool media guy, Portnoy, who I, I don't Portnoy. know. Yeah. yeah. I don't know where that scandal uh, is at currently. I don't really pay attention, but I remember seeing uh, a, a woman or women, they, they've come out and said that he raped them or, or some, 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 something between consensual sex and rape. I don't know. Um, and these girls though, were just random girls, I guess he met on social media and then he ends up hooking up with them and now it's coming back to haunt him. But I mean, how stupid do you have to be to be him in his position, rich, controversial, a lot of people coming after him and you're banging random girls that you meet on social media. Like you are an actual you are an idiot. You yeah. are, you, or or so deviant. You just can't control yourself. Like contrast that with um, the Saudi Arabian prince. What do they call? I don't. They just call him MBS. That guy, right? Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's probably in his thirties and infinite money and whatever. I remember reading about. So how does he do it? Here's what he did. So he got his buddies together. They rented out an entire island somewhere beautiful. And they flew in a bunch of girls and all of these girls had to sign NDAs. They had to get STD checks and, uh, and they, they had security everywhere on the Island. And then they did what they did. And, and that was the end of it, but nobody, and they paid them did, well to keep their mouth. They shut. paid them exactly paid them a lot of money. And, yeah. but, but there were, there were legal, there were, there were contracts in place, right? Sure. Paid them a lot of money and, and, uh, lawyers took care of, uh, making sure that this, that no details were going to be leaked by anybody like that's what you do if you want to be a degenerate and you have money now of course mbs has money on another level but still the point is how dumb are you to just find random girls online to have sex with and think that's not going to come back to haunt you especially when well, look you're at, not uh, only rich but now you're a political target as well like you're dumb period. look at the you're quarterback dumb. for houston Deshaun Watson. Yeah, Des Des Deshaun Watson basically hitting girls on uh, uh, Deshaun Watson, the quarterback for Houston, basically hitting oh. these chicks up on social media, Instagram, whatever, and getting him to come over for massage and then trying to bang them. And like That's just random chicks that he's like trying to pull off of Instagram. I mean, what are you uh, doing? The uh, uh, I, I hung. If you, you know, just just pay high class high escorts, end, yeah. like just do that. What are you doing? Well, that's what, you know, uh, Barkley and all those guys. I mean, that's what they did. They had uh, just high priced girls that they paid to keep their mouth shut and be able to handle their business and not make them look stupid. And what's hilarious now is that those girls uh, have come out and like started their own podcast. And now they, they like, we'll talk about that. Like the one with, Oh yeah. Like uh, the one with uh, Odell Beckham jr. Where the chick was talking about, he likes to get shit on. 
I don't know if you saw that one, but there was a whole podcast with all these girls. Why? Saw, why can they? Why can they say these things now? Like, well, they. I, I guess they fucking. Who knows? But like these girls were high price escorts, like you know, in the you know professional athlete realm of keeping their mouth shut, whatever. And then these chicks get on a podcast and just start fucking outing dudes, and uh, uh, like it was like we saw it. We popped up, at, you know, and we're like, holy shit! Like this is fucking crazy. Well, the Browns of all teams. Come yeah, on. it's too easy. It is. That's why he had to leave. But that was pretty much the end of him at the Browns. Uh, but like, I mean, there's some weird. Was shit. was like, the 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 shitting scandal? Uh, I think uh, it was. Well, I don't think he ever <laughs> fucking put like like. I mean, how do you come back from that one? You deny it. Ah, uh, he did, and he's like, "Well, I, I've never met that girl before." And then she had like pictures. No, of no, him you don't and, say that. No, 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 no. You you just say, "I don't like to be shit on." <laughs> yeah, there's a weird one, but uh, like. I think in today's, you know, like uh, um, MJ and, uh, you know, Tiger Woods and like, you know, Barkley and those guys, uh, that existed in a different time in this fucking universe. Yeah. Now it's social media where, you know, social media and podcasts and this and everybody's looking for their next piece. But like you said, Dave yeah. Portnoy getting wrapped up in that. Holy shit. Yeah. I mean, you know, that seems uh, out of character. And then I think he claimed that it was some character assassination by some group. And I know I think that's what he was going back on. But. I mean, but, but he, I mean, he did. He did hook up with. Yeah, these he girls, was slaying these so, chicks. I mean, just, and then they probably found him. Probably somebody paid him to fucking talk about it and to throw him under the bus. Of course, but again, when you make yourself a, and at this point, he's a political target. He is a, a target for for cancellation. Then you're you're making it easy for your enemies when you're doing stuff like that. Sure, sure. Because how much do these girls have to get paid to to make claims like that? It might not be that much money. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe a free pizza. Isn't that his it's whole possible. stick where he goes I mean, and hey, uh, pizzas? Donuts, donuts convince people to get vaccinated, so you don't need much more than that. <laughs> how, maybe how many two donuts, maybe how two many, donuts. How many donuts did it take you to get the vax? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I get I get I get asked about uh, I get asked about that. No, I'm not vaccinated. And I've had COVID twice. And it was mild congestion both times. The second time was so mild, I wouldn't have actually even known. I was really only like a little bit congested at night. But how did you I get know, it twice? Well, the first time I got it from a guy I work with. We were on a ski trip. His idiot girlfriend went to Miami with her idiot friends and I don't know, did whatever they do in Miami, licking whatever they lick and came back with COVID and didn't, didn't self quarantine didn't get tested which generally i'm not for making more of covid than than is warranted by by reason and data but it, this is this is also it was during spring break when covid was 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 surging down in sure. miami right so if you're going to go to miami you're going to pack yourself in clubs and do whatever you're going to do with whoever you're going to do it with and, and then come back I, I think that it would be reasonable to just stick to yourself for a few days um, maybe have a little home test just, just to check it out. Right. And again, COVID poses little risk to most people, but I do think that would be reasonable. Right. Didn't do that though. This girl comes back and the guy I work with, he didn't think about it at all. Oh yeah, probably fine. No, no, she had COVID. Her friends had COVID. One of her friend's moms actually got rocked by it. It messed her lungs up. Um, I don't, I don't have the most recent update, but apparently she was told she might have to get a lung transplant at some point. It was bad. Like she was in the, it, it messed the mom up. Right. And so my buddy who I work with, he ends up getting it asymptomatic though, for the first bit, it has that inc incubation period. This is right before we go on this ski trip. Um, I find out his girlfriend was positive. I ask him to get tested before we go. Uh, he tests negative. All right, fine. Uh, I was like, okay, if you test negative, let's go. He was positive, uh, in the middle of the trip, he, he then develops symptoms. And so I'm in the car with him and he's coughing. And I'm so I accept uh, that this is it. Uh, it looks like I'm getting the Rona. I'm fine. And we'll, we'll see how it goes. I wasn't concerned because the data made it clear there is no reason to be concerned given my age and health status and so forth. Um, but, but that's how I got it the first time. And I was mildly congested for a few days. Felt like maybe a one out of 10 head cold at, at, at most, right? And then the second time, months later, um, many, many months later, I guess, uh, maybe six, seven, eight months later, my, my parents came for my daughter's birthday. And the day before, my dad is 
not feeling so good. It, it generally, it starts in people's throats. They, they get, they get a sore throat and then the throat really starts to hurt. And then it progresses from there. So that starts for him. He doesn't come to the party. My mom comes to the party, not telling us that she told us like, Oh yeah, you know, uh, your dad's not feeling so good. So he's just going to play it safe and not come like, no, he was really not feeling well. He was clearly something was going on. She comes to the party, gives it to basically everyone at the party. And then they then go through um, a couple of weeks of uh, my dad had to go to the hospital. He was okay. He didn't have to, he just, he waited too long. His SPO2 levels, he, he waited until they were in the eighties, like 84, 85 for, for oxygen saturation, which is a mistake. I mean, you're supposed to go, if it's downtrending and you're seeing now 93, 92, just go to the hospital, just go. Uh, and because if you let it dip below 90 research shows that, especially if you're an older man, that the risk of dying actually. So he's fine now, no long COVID or anything. And so anyway, that's how I got it the second time. And so I had it, um, I'm sure my kids had it. My son was coughing for a few days. My daughter was coughing for like a day. My wife had no symptoms at all. And I, again, I was mildly congested for a couple of nights. And so, um, given I, I've looked at, at least, I'm sure you guys have seen it. I have looked at at least, I don't know, 15 papers on natural immunity in terms of duration and robustness. And even if you take natural immunity out of the picture, again, COVID poses little risk to someone like me and people sure. like you, there, there really isn't a rational reason to care much for your own personal health. And then you add natural immunity into it. And now it's even more irrelevant. It is so irrelevant that uh, it would be irrational to even give it a second thought really. And my second bout with COVID battle with COVID, I'm a COVID survivor, actually. Yep. Um, <laughs> uh, two purple it, hearts i'm a hero i'm a hero and it, it was it was so mild that again i wouldn't have even known i actually i still would have ended up going to the gym because I, I for about three nights i was a little bit congested at night where i was like oh that's a little bit odd that's it otherwise i wouldn't have known and and uh it's funny because about six months after it had begun so we're at we're in the middle of 2020 I had uh, recorded a podcast and I was commenting about COVID and why I do not care about it for my personal health. And I was going over the data. It was clear at that time with the data that we had that it was nothing like the media was portraying it in the beginning. I don't know if you remember, but you remember the 8% kill rate the media was hyperventilating about because of what <sighs> was what was seen in Northern Italy. And that's yeah. it. That's going to be, we're all going to die. And, and then fast forward to the middle of 2020, and, it, and it's, it becomes clear that the risk factor varies by like a factor of 1,000, uh, depending on your age and your health status. And again, I'm 37, no comorbidities, um, uh, physically active. I, I do even a bit of cardio every day, and that in particular has been shown to uh, help protect against uh, and and speed up recovery. And so at that time I was trying to explain to people, here's why I personally don't care. I, I don't want to give it to others. And I understand that some people are, at, uh, they, 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 they should out, maybe not, maybe worry isn't the word, but they should be aware that uh, well, maybe they have a certain people, a 3% are, chance yeah, of dying. Certain or people something, are you know? in like a bigger risk factor. Like if right. you're 50 years old and you're a hundred pounds overweight and you have zero aerobic capacity, which a friend of ours actually fit within yeah. that. You don't want to uh, get COVID. You really he, don't because he it, got COVID it, and was fucking going down. And uh, we reached out to one of our doctor buddies who there's like a whole, um, you know, frontline doctor's protocol, yep. which he got to the guy and pretty much saved his life. Like mm -hmm. if we, if, if he hadn't interjected when he did, this dude would have lost his fight. And I saw him recently and now he's like, how was he treated? Uh, the frontline doctor's deal had like, a, um, it was like a protocol that was like, a. I Some supplements, ivermectin. Yeah, it was like supplements, zinc, yeah. yeah, hydroxychloroquine, Quercetin. ivermectin. There was also some like antibody thing. I mean, they had like a pretty good like pharmacy yeah. pack thing. And he was fine in like three days. And then I saw him yep. a couple weeks ago and now he's like 125 pounds overweight. And I was like, wow, you didn't take that as God's wake up call to fucking get a little fitness back in the life. And I realized that unfortunately, regardless of sickness and illness, people are going to do what they're going to do. And, uh, you know, I think what's fascinating. What was his response to that out of curiosity? How does he view that? It didn't necessarily give me a, uh, 
uh, like we didn't really get into it. So like wow. I'm not real big to like uh, I'm sure for you. Uh, if somebody asks me questions yeah. or wants to engage in information and, or they show interest, I'll engage. I'm not going to like be the guy who like stops in the gym to offer some girl advice yeah. on how to do her glute thruster. You know, like, hey, you'd be a lot more glute activation if you did this. Or the guy who just randomly starts giving people fucking fitness and training advice. If somebody comes to me and asks me a question, what do you think of this? Hey, this is what I think. This is what the research says. This is what uh, I know to be anecdotal. And this is what we've seen over our hundreds of thousands of data points over the last 10 years. Unless it's your skin routine. <laughs> and everyone's asking. You know, oh, yeah. DMs. Oh, fuck. So did, did you ever notice like on uh, social media, people be like, um, uh, I get hit up a lot in my DMs about my skincare routine. So I'm going to take you through it and then I'm going to sell these products so that they make it sound like the world is asking them for their skin routine. And I'm like, I don't know. You look like an old leather football. So I don't know what the <laughs> fuck you're doing. It's just a bunch of Botox. Yeah. Those are the fake. Those are when. When they're doing their little Q and anything, those, you know, yeah, what I mean? yeah it's the so, yeah. So then, but plug. Uh, like, I'm sure for you, I mean, you've written so much about it and talked about Please it. Please so tell much. me the exact products you use and make sure to share your uh, yeah. affiliate link as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And for to save 10%, use, you know, fucking big dick 10. Uh, oh, the uh, 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 Legion, big uh, dick yeah, 10. Yeah. I'm guys, sorry. Yeah. 10% I'll, set that yeah. Off. I'll, hey, I'll set that up for you if you want to Dude, use it. If you go to Legion Supplements and you enter Big Dick 10, you'll get 50% off. Wait a minute. Shouldn't it be 10, 50, Big Dick 50? Who knows? Nobody knows. It's the internet. We'll s- w- check the show notes. <laughs> yeah, check we'll the set show that notes. Up, no, no. You can, make it more, you can make it more esoteric. What is that? Is it, um, is it there, there's a law, kind of like the Pareto principle. It might be prices where it's 50% of the output is produced by uh, 10% of the causes. So yes. You just, you just. Yeah. You know, no, it's, it's all numbers. It's all mathematics. Big brain move. But. Uh, yeah, the, uh, man. So like for me, if somebody wants to come over and talk to me about training or I don't know, like, uh, like, so for my, uh, my sons, uh, to coach my son's basketball, there's one, a lot of bad fucking parents in this world. Uh, the fact that I had to go through this, I had to go through a background check. I had to go through a concussion protocol and I had to go to this meeting with this like speaker about how to not be one of those parents that like, you know, they make movies about where you're like, yeah. you know, out there fucking trying to fight the refs and the coaches and for your five-year-old's basketball. So I got to go to this thing and we're watching all these movies and then, uh, you know, they're showing all these asshole parents and clips and fights. And then we're sitting at this table and they turn and they're like, Hey, um, can you guys turn within your table and have a meaningful discussion on your co- on your experience with being coached? And so I turned to these people and they start giving me stories about like when they were like six, seven, eight and 10 years old. Because I realized that they hadn't really played competitive sports past maybe sometime in high school. And they're like, well, what was your experience with coaching? And I'm like, you mean me coaching or me being coached? And uh, they asked, like, you know, you being coached. And I was like, uh, you know, wh- where do you want to start on this? And, uh, you know, I'm like, it just was interesting that, you know, these people's first default was like, you know, them not getting kicked and in, in picked in kickball. You know, me being a pro ball alternate was a little bit different and getting screwed out of that, you know. So it was, uh, it's just interesting perception, but if people ask me about training or fitness or health or whatever, I'm more than happy to talk to them about it, but I don't go over and be like, I can tell you're 150 pounds overweight and you probably are going to die from COVID. Let me give you some fucking advice. Like if, if, if that doesn't give somebody a wake up call, then I don't know whatever will, no words that I'm have are just going to be, you know, ill fated and fall on deaf ears. Do you have a skincare routine though? Yes, I do. Really? Interesting. I moisturize. No. Uh, what, what's the American psycho where he's like. Use a moisturizer without alcohol because alcohol dries you out and makes you look old. <laughs> it's a great scene, great movie. Ah, oh, dude, I great uh, performance. There was oh, a yeah. there was a time where I watched that movie enough to where I memorized some of the monologues. Uh, but it's did been you read a while. the book though? Yes, of course, okay, uh, multiple good. times. Okay, to good. the point where I was reading the book on an airplane. And I got nervous that the lady behind me was reading over my shoulder, and so I like turned because the book is so fucking graphic. But yeah, yeah, no, I love the book. The movie was great. I thought Bale did such an amazing job. The problem is, is I read the book after I saw the movie. So Same. as you're reading it, you're picturing Christian Bale as the individual and hearing his voice, and it totally worked. I mean, yeah, I, I think in in that uh, I know people. I don't read that much fiction, but I know a lot of people who or people who do often will say they don't like seeing the movie first because then when they read the book, it just doesn't really jive with you know, what they're, what they would have imagined or, or how they see the characters or the settings or, or whatever. But I don't know if you could, could you envision a better Patrick Bateman than Christian Bale's for him? No. I mean, uh, he, he was, that yeah. was the ultimate casting. Yeah. He, he was great. The, uh, the other one, 
uh, was I don't know if you read any of the, if you read the Lord of the Rings book and the Hobbit and yeah. all that. So yeah, I, yeah. I I read all those and then saw the movies, and it was cool to see the movies because I never really pictured what the Ents look like. Remember like the big trees when they're walking, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and when I saw the movie and like a lot of the imagery within the Lord of the Rings, like brought characters to life that I hadn't necessarily given enough thought of what they look like. I just read them as big trees. I'm like, I just didn't really think of them. Like, There's trees, whatever. I'll go on. And then when you yeah. see them as like old and the voice and they're moving, like that was super cool because that actually made it a much better experience. So I almost wish that I had, if, if I had read the book ahead of, or if I'd seen the movies before I'd read the books, I you think it would have been a, yeah, it, it would have enjoyed, but like I still love, I mean, yeah. And then people always bitch, and especially people that read the books, they want to tell you all the reasons that the movie sucks because it's missing things out of the book. And I'm like, well, first of all, it was already nine fucking hours. Like they couldn't make 15 hours to get all this shit in and they made a good story out of it. And well, this is wrong. I'm like, well, fuck. Like look at them as two separate things. Like why do you have to look at them? It's like uh, when they made, they remade Point Break. They shouldn't have called it Point Break. They should have just made another movie. I know. Breaking Point. Yeah. Fucking awful. Don't call it Point Break. So, but yeah. Didn't, I uh, did, did I, did I? here is that true that is it hbo they're, they're doing a lord of the rings thing putting a ton of money into it oh amazon amazon's i don't is know it amazon yeah i'm not sure okay. if it's the they're redo no way they're redoing peter jackson no, no, it's some, some it, it's probably something so it's gonna like be a, star it's wars gonna just yeah it's gonna be absurdly woke and what you mean like with the hobbit like i don't know uh, what else he they're wrote. doing a lord of the rings thing like, I don't, yeah I yeah like, a, like there's a mini these series, uh, right or uh, like a boba fett mini series Oh, so they're doing a spinoff like that. They're going to go like Bilbo or something. This is me just assuming that they're not going to redo Peter Jackson. Bilba, story. because now they are non-binary. So mm. don't, mis- mo- don't misgender them. Well, you know what's interesting about the hobbits? They always ask. They always thought uh, like one of the stories was that the uh, no, it was the dwarfs. Remember that they were always surprised. They were like, oh, because the dwarf women look like the male dwarfs are hard to tell the difference. Mm. So they're kind of androgynous, I guess, if the right word is like they're just one. So don't you remember we talked about that with the dwarfs? No. Because they always ask about like dwarf women and they're like, oh, they just kind of look like all the rest of us. Dude, are, dude you're sounding like a, a metaverse nerd, like analyzing the uh, sex of I, Lord of the Rings characters. Dude, I read all the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit books. So uh, I, I loved them. I mean, I also read all the Dune books. And dude, I love the Dune books. Well, ha- what is your avatar going to be like in the... Oh, uh, I would totally be a Fremen. I don't know what that is. Uh, well, the problem now is that they came out with the new Dune movie, which is excellent. I fell asleep. But if you read the books and you got into that whole thing, I mean, Power Athletes basically built on the law of the Fremen. The Spice? Yeah. I mean, Arrakis. God created Arrakis to train the, the faithful. I mean, it's it's like there's so many metaphors for religion. I'm just making jokes on well, that. But, South Park did a take but, on Dune. But there is like the original Dune books are like I, I read them all. They were Fucking, and then they got to the point where I don't even know what I was reading anymore. They were so confusing, but uh, it's it's a cool piece. But I, I you know, I've I've, uh, I've always tried to balance reading fiction with nonfiction. So if I read one nonfiction, I try to read a fiction book, and I try to like at least balance some stuff out. Unfortunately, uh, I think I found as the older I get is that the nonfiction is actually more fantastic than the fiction. So they say that, you know, reality is a lot more interesting than, than, you know, than making it up. I mean, the shit you read where you're like, I would have never have written that. So. I mean, that's where that's where a lot of inspiration for fiction comes from. A lot of uh, accomplished fiction writers, they read primarily nonfiction for to find swipe, to find material for characters and settings and plots. And uh, that that, of course, helps with verisimilitude. It helps with making it feel real because um like uh, george uh, R. R. martin i think his his inspiration for game of thrones for example was the war of the roses was he's very into history and he took a lot of what was going on during, uh, into into his own into his own universe and you know, according to his own ideas so I, yeah, I read a bit more autistically than you. So I read on a genre. I have a rotation. I have two different genre rotations. One are work-related books, and then one, that's one list. And the other list is, is just personal stuff that, that I like to read. And so I, I flip-flop between those, and I just go. I read one or two books in one genre related to work, one or two books in one, in, in one genre related to something more personal. And then so one of the, the buckets is fiction slash literature 
um, which is just for me, like read something that's a classic, uh, read the Iliad or something, uh, or, or poetry. And so I don't, I don't read much fiction, but it's in my, you know, I'm only getting through a couple fiction books a year because I, I don't prioritize it. But uh, that I, I find that that serves, I guess, my interests more because um, I have a, a, obviously a lot of my time and a lot of my focus is on work. So that's, that's 50% of my reading and then more personal for fun stuff. I, I'll enjoy fiction, but it has to be really good. If it's not really good, I would rather read nonfiction. Or, or you get like 50 pages in and you're like, oh, this fucking sucks. I'm going to throw this yeah. book away. And then, and then I, I, I have a hard time quitting books if I don't like them. I mean, I'll do it, but begrudgingly. I'll, I'll be yeah. more inclined to finish it. Just to grit it out. I, um, you know, I, I did watch the Game of Thrones TV shows. And uh, after watching them, it gave me zero interest in reading the books. So I know people are like, oh, it spurred me to go read the books. Uh, I got on and listened to the people griping and battling and fighting about this. And, the, and I was like, oh, this is too much. I don't have enough time to fucking dedicate into this. And so I didn't even crack one. Well, the author doesn't even have enough time to finish it. Uh, I think he just got bored of fucking doing it. Or and, rich. And, and rich. Yeah, yeah, he got paid and was like, fuck you. Yeah, I mean, he's probably well, that's made... Why the- that's why uh, the couple, last one a couple sucked. hundred million dollars by now and he's like yeah, the, dude i'm old the, and i'm fat and yeah. you know everything hurts and i can barely get out of bed and the, the the checks don't bounce so whatever well i mean they uh they had to pull like what three directors to come up with the ending for the game of thrones and they botched watched it. it i mean of yeah. course everyone yeah. is gonna agree but it oh, was with awful. dune with dune I didn't read the I didn't read any of the books. I might read the book. I did like the movie. I thought it was especially read read, read Dune and then Dune Messiah is the second book. Okay. Like there's I think there's four or five. There there might be more, but I, I think I read like into the fourth book and the first two pretty much gave you everything you needed to know. Okay. But that that plot point, which I guess this is a spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't seen, so you might want to mute if you're if you're so the Atreides, uh, they've that. moved now to Arrakis. They have... Uh, okay, so so they've replaced the Harkonnens. The Harkonnens are all pissed. The Atreides, they know this because they left the guy there in the wall to try to kill the kid or kill whoever he can kill. And this this Atreides patriarch, he's supposed to be this... I mean, he's supposed to be capable enough to, to have... I guess conquered a planet. He has a planet that he runs and apparently he has like a, an amazing military and he's a brilliant military commander. And so he goes to Arrakis and he has no army with him. I guess that that amounts to anything. He has no security that amounts to anything. He has no intelligence uh, network set up that, that, that amounts to anything. And the stupid little doctor is able to disable the handful of guards who are supposed to be protecting him and his family, lower the shields. Oh, the Harkonnens, uh, they're striking back. Oh, I would have never thought of that. I still like the movie, but that was one of those things that it just pulls you out of Dispelled it. You know I mean? your belief. Uh, exactly. That suspension of disbelief starts to fade. And you're like, there's no way the, it's different in the book. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's so spoilers. I was, I was, I was like, there's how, how, how could somebody who, yeah. How could you write that novel and, and put that plot point in there when everything else is supposed to be so well thought out and sophisticated? I mean, that, 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 that's something that, if my nine-year-old son in his creative writing class in school came up with that, I'd be like, oh, that's pretty, that's actually. Uh, there's holes in your plot, kid. Yeah, Go but back. that's pretty good. Go that's a pretty good job. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, would, I, would, I, would give him, I would give him a thumbs up. I would say it doesn't exact, it probably wouldn't work like that, but, I, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty good for you. That's pretty good for, for a nine-year-old. Uh, but for an adult who makes their living writing stories, come on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but you said it didn't happen in the book. Like yeah, that, it, so. it was it was a little different. So yeah, there's the book is good. So I definitely re- highly recommend to go read it if you have the free time. So odd odd choice then that they that they put it in the movie like that because certainly uh, they could have come with they they could have come up with something different. Come on, uh, I think they did it for time. Uh, yeah, I think well, of course, they did of course, is they you know, and I, I always uh, and I think it's interesting too that they split it into two parts. The first book. So obviously the movie's the first part, uh, which is interesting because they could have taken the time to develop that a little bit better than they did. Well, I still liked it though. Yeah, the, the no, director I mean, did a great job. Yeah, the the imagery was really good. The scenes it was it was powerful to see. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see it in IMAX in the movie theaters, so that's, I had to yeah, end up. Yeah, that sucked. So I was that's watching what I it. Did. I didn't do the streaming. Yeah, I should have yeah. gone and seen it, but yeah, I, I downloaded it and then we watched it, and I was like, ah, 
this would have been way better on a 40 foot tall screen surrounded by it because then the scenes would have been way more rich so, part two part two i think it was you shot in imax too so it was yeah. intense yeah cool well right. this concludes part two with mike matthews thanks yeah. for Returning to Power Athlete Radio. Yeah, dude. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for uh, coming in and regaling us with stories and always making yeah, us feel like mental midgets. Having me. For, so muscle for muscle for life. The yeah, right. book. That that's that 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 is uh, that's what I live for. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Check that out. And Mike, is it Amazon? Where can people find it? Uh, wherever they, wherever they buy books, uh, a lot of people, obviously that's Amazon, but also, I mean, this, this is actually my first traditionally published book. So I'm doing it with Simon and Schuster. So distribution is obviously one of, one of the, one of the strengths of a, of a mainstream publisher. So really anywhere people buy books, uh, they can find it. And that of course it's going to be in bookstores as well. And I'm actually, I know officially it's releasing on January 11th. So I'm not sure, I guess that's how bookstores I haven't. I don't actually buy books in bookstores. I just go to like look at books and find covers I like and titles I like and stuff. Um, but I'm guessing they roll it out on the day in in the store. But that's when it's going to be shipping. And I'm also to make it fun. I'm doing like a whole giveaway thing over at Muscle for Life uh, F O R Muscle for Life Book dot com, and I'm giving away. I think cool, sweet, awesome. Yeah, dude. I think it might be my internet might be a little bit wonky. That rural. I'm on. I'm on a four G router. <laughs> oh wow <laughs> oh you guys don't have a fucking hard line of fiber directly into your uh we do not place? we uh. do not and it's not i don't think it's coming uh, anytime soon i'm 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 hoping starlink or i'm hoping the 4g turns into 5g i've been i've only been here since april but when i got here in april i there was no 5g anywhere it was all 4g now well, yeah, 5g causes you know your brain to explode well, uh, well, well, yeah, exactly. Actually, there is no COVID uh, virus. There is no SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's just it's 5G. 5G. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The COVIDians are 5 years. Yeah, one and the same. Exactly. Uh, so, so now, now uh, driving three or four minutes, I, I see on my phone 5G. So maybe this 4G router will turn into a 5G router before Starlink comes. Either one will take care of my needs. Cool. Awesome, man. Well, thanks Sweet. for tuning in to another episode of Power Athlete Radio. Bye. Bye.